Is that your hat? <laughs> is, uh, is anyone here for the um, Sean Harris? Sean Harris, the Harris thing? First parish. Really. First parish? Okay. Um, should have said. Um, he has. Submitted a letter requesting his application be withdrawn without prejudice so that he can work more on addressing. I think, I don't know, I, I, he didn't sp say specifically what the reasons were, but in any event, our ordinary procedure on a request to withdraw without prejudice is to allow it. Okay, so um, just so you don't sit here. It's done. it's done. We will we will be voting to allow it to be withdrawn without prejudice. You can hang around for that vote if you want. So then, if something changes in the future, do we? Get He'll have to refile. Letter, like, yes, yes. It's like this never happened. Okay. okay? So yes. Okay. Yeah. But I'm keeping your file. Your substantial <laughs> file. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, Frank. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? Good. Is Sarah coming? Yeah. She's not. Oh, On vacation. Okay, yeah. good. Well, did you vote today? Crank her up. <laughs> this is the. Oh. I get, so infrequently do I get to use this. This is the October 18th, 2012 meeting of the Situate Zoning Board of Appeals. <laughs> First matter. Our first application is um, the Sean Harris, a 26 And Mr. Harris has submitted a letter. Yes, correct. To, um, requesting that it be withdrawn without prejudice. Correct. Okay. And we have advised him that he doesn't need to be here. Correct. Okay. As we do for everyone. A motion. Move to allow the withdrawal at the applicant's request without prejudice. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Mr. Harris shall return to us at a date in the future. Next one. Our second application is John Tedeschi of 17. Mr. Henderson, before I turn it over to you, I want to ask Mr. Tedeschi if he's related to Susan. She's my wife, but she doesn't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Pretty comical, actually. Yeah. Yeah. They swap. Yeah. A lot of different things. And, uh, Susan knew that she was afraid of before. She even Is that right? Yeah. They, they well, tried to call the wrong person. <laughs> I, I, I have. No, I know I'm not Frank. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Don't you wish you were Derek Trucks' brother in law? He's a very, very talented singer. Yeah. And, uh, I, I've met them both. They're, yeah. Well, I, I just, uh, I'm sorry to delay the, your, your, your beginning. I, um, I share the same name as um, the gentleman who is now the executive secretary of the town of Braintree. He's Peter L. Morin. And when I was in the legislature in the 1980s, Peter Morin was the director, the staff director for Bill Keating, who was a state senator at the time. So I used to trade mail uh, we used to get together in the hallway to trade mail that would had been incorrectly delivered to one another. Uh, and then, then Mr. Morin um, was also employed as a uh, counsel to the inpatients, the involuntarily committed patients at Bridgewater State Hospital, which meant that I would get phone calls at 2.30 or 3 mm. o'clock in the morning um, from people thinking that they were talking to their lawyer. Anyway. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> These, what would meetings like this be without slight diversions? <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Chanis. I am Richard Henderson from Henderson and Henderson and Cohasset, representing Mr. Tedeschi. And with me is Jeff Hassett from Morris Engineering Company, um, who's going to be helping me in a second here explain the plan in more detail. Um, let me start, though. What I wanted to do is go over the background, talk about the plans uh, generally, let Jeff talk about it more specifically, address the special appointment criteria, and then I should explain that the property is not owned by Mr. Tedeschi. It's owned by the Stonefields, who are here this evening. Um, John and Jane, who are both from uh, the plenty of towns in Massachusetts, who have an immense amount of history about the background of this property, and that's kind of where I want to start. Um, this is an unimproved parcel of land in an R3 zone in a floodplain and watershed protection over, over <coughs> ride district. <coughs> the property has been in some capacity in the Stonefield family since 1930. I have indeed the Stonefields with me this evening, the current owners, which goes back to the 80s, and Mr. Stonefield's current owners going back to 1952, prior to the zoning. So this gives a history of how long they owned it. The important part to start out with is that this is a non-conforming lot. Um, it is laid out or described in a plan going back as far as 1953. In fact, here is a 1921 <coughs> land court plan, which will solve that problem. Uh, as to the issue of their not having been joint ownership with adjacent properties, the Stonefields can address this, but as I mentioned, they've owned it since 1952. They've never owned adjacent property. It was in the family prior to that, at least to 1930, and there's no record of any Stonefields having adjacent property. And Mr. Stonefield himself went through the assessor's map. So I think we can honestly say that this is a lot. <coughs> that was shown on a plan, described in a deed, existed on record before 1953, has never held in common ownership, and has, as you can see from that survey, at least 50 feet of frontage, and that survey confirms the same thing. The other interesting thing about this lot is that um, it is taxed as a developable lot, and this will show you the current assessment is over $160,000 on this piece of property. And it also has the benefit of a sewer connection and a betterment, which is decayed. So for all intents and purposes, it's been treated over its history as a developable lot. Um, and let me sort of describe what we want to do now. This is, as I mentioned before, a floodplain watershed or floodplain district. But <clears throat> this house, and Jeff can get into this in more detail, as it sits on this lot, Obviously, can't comply with the area because it hasn't been around a lot. I mean, the, the lot predates. But as far as the setbacks for this property, it's more than eight feet on both sides. It's more than 20 feet in the rear. So to the extent that it can comply with current setback requirements in the R3 district, it has done that. There will be some fill um, to bring it up to the 10-foot uh, contour level. Filling itself is not prohibited. And I have a letter. Going back to 202 from John Richardson, and noted um, wetlands individual, and uh, who has indicated that there are no wetlands on the properties, so filling it should not be um, a, sig a significant issue. Um, also, I've spoken with uh, the current wetland specialist who's helping Mr. Use the letter about not having any impact on the wetlands, and the current uh, wetlands person with whom John is working has also indicated. And I agree that um, there's no, no protective right under Chapter 41, Chapter 131, Section 40, violated by, by going into a tidal floodplain as opposed to a floodplain involving um, a lake, stream, pond, or wetland. <coughs> tidal waters are not protected under that particular wetland statute. So there are no other protected interests here. The key issue is have we, have we met standards for floodplain? Uh, can we avoid flooding? And is there a, a way to address drainage issues so adjacent properties won't be affected? So I'm going to let Jeff talk about the height of the property and the drainage issues and the drainage system that's been designed. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Hold on one second. Before we get to talking about specifics, let me just see if we're on the same page. Yeah, it's, it's section 4470.9, yeah. which is kind of a catch-all section that says that this board is satisfied that it is not, not in flooding. fact, subject to, to flooding. flooding. 
And that is, we have to make a specific condition that it is not, in right. fact, subject and to flooding. That, and that drainage will not impact adjacent properties. Right. Those are the two criteria. Right. Well, we well, also well, have to meet. Up, up, up. Let's just stop on that not, in fact, subject to flooding because we. No, no, no. no. We have had, uh, as you may, uh, you may be aware, um, this this board, <coughs> or at least a a controlling minority of this board, has held in the recent past that a lot that is subject to occasional overwash is in fact subject to flooding and not entitled to a floodplain special permit. Occasional overwash. How, yes. how occasional? Well, I mean, I, uh, you know, that wasn't really, it wasn't pertinent to the minority controlling the the, uh, the position on that. So I would, I would it, it, in the, at some point in the course of your address, your your comments, I would like to know um, if this particular lot has been um, has been. Um, you'll 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 have an opportunity. Yeah. Just just be bear in mind that it is an issue that we've had to deal with. Yeah, I understand. And, and from an evidentiary point of view, you're looking at the wrong guy because yeah. I've never seen the land. <laughs> However, Mr. Stonefield <laughs> has had familiarity with it since at least 1952, and he can address how often there has been wash or accumulation of water on that lot. So I don't think there's any better source than someone who's been familiar with. And you may you may ask him to speak at any time. I just wanted you to. That it's no, no, I do, and I did. I kept. I was going to let Jeff talk about the plan. Then I was going to do a little bit of special permit criteria. And then I was going to have. It's your, okay. Whatever you do. Great. Whatever Thank you. Like. you. Sure. I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Asset with Morris Engineering. Um, this property is at the maximum limit of the floodplain and watershed protection district. The actual elevation is elevation 9.18 at the datum that this survey is on. That contour runs right here. Um, yeah. uh, the property is located within a uh, elevation 10, um, and therefore the dwelling will be constructed um, per the building requirements within the flood zone. Um, this building will be supported on uh, on piles, and the first floor will be ele elevated well above the well above the um, FEMA flood zone elevation 10. Um, it will not require foundation walls um, except on piles. And it's really minimal grade, straight on the next couple of feet. There will be one area, one slab boarded elevation 10 points that's under the dwelling. Um, and that is not an enclosure, it's simply an area to park a car, kind of like a patio under the dwelling. Yeah. Um, this project will require the approval um, from the conservation for storm stormwater permit. Um, but the intent is that we'll provide groundwater, direct the uh, roof runoff. To a subsurface infiltration system located behind the dwelling, and uh, therefore this will not uh, this will not affect the uh, the existing drainage patterns in any way. It will promote groundwater recharge. Where's the septic? The front? It's on the front. Oh, it's town. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that it? Okay. Hey, what what I what I thought I do is just quickly go over the criteria under first and eight and section nine to make sure that. We meet all those standards, and then I think I will let Mr. Stonefield talk about, or I can have him tell you now before I get in the criteria, whichever is easiest for you. But I'd rather just um, address some of the conditions because I think I don't think there's any question that we don't violate any of them, and I just want to. Um, but I can deal deal with it in any order you think is appropriate. It's your it's your application. Okay. I you, what you ha clearly had a plan when you came in. I, I don't want to upset it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the um, the criteria in this section itself are simple. They are one that it, it doesn't flood, and said it to you are believing my witness. We will allege that it doesn't flood at this point, which I think is the case. The drainage conditions have already been addressed by Jeff. Um, all, all of the drain, everything is tied into a stormwater system, so there's little or no possibility that we will in any way exacerbate over off flow from this lot or cause any increase in accumulation of water anywhere on the property. So I think we've dealt with those. Um, section nine is, there are conditions A through F. One is the site is a specific and appropriate location for use or structure. Well, if you conclude that it is in fact not subject to flooding, 
and we are not causing any drainage issues, then I think it's a single family neighborhood. I don't know what could be more appropriate than a single family house in a single family neighborhood. The use developed will not adversely affect the neighborhood. Well, the neighborhood itself um, is improved on most lots by single family homes. This lot itself is an ugly, over vegetated piece of land that adds no value to anyone's property, including the landowner. So anything that improves it to make it more consistent with the neighborhood will be an enhancement and certainly not an adverse effect. Um, in terms of not being undue nuisance, serious hazard to vehicles or pedestrians as a result of the proposed use, it's like every other use in the neighborhood, it's single family. It's, it'll have a driveway, it'll have a, a sewer connection, it will comply, it'll have utility permits, and so there's nothing that could cause or in any way um, be injurious or dam damaging to the public health or to the neighborhood as a whole. <clears throat> and then there's no sp specific impact on water supply. Well, again, it's a single family house. It's, it's not a major development. So none of the criteria in either section nine or seven or 470 are in any way violated, provided you accept the finding that it doesn't flood. At this point, I, Mr. Stonefield and I met earlier today and he explained to me um, the history of this property and also the history in terms of its flooding, its distance from the ocean, and um, its proximity to a new tidal outlet. So I, I think if he could speak now, it would be great because he's been familiar with the property for over 50 years. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, like we said, my family has owned that since the 30s, and as far back as I can remember, and I'm in the 70s, <coughs> 70s now. Don't look a day over 60. <laughs> <laughs> The only time I ever remember any water reaching that lot was in 78. And it, the, at that point, there was a little bit in the back corner of it, no closer to the ocean. The, the lot itself is well over, over a tenth of a mile from the ocean itself. So, and that's the only time in all the years that I can remember that there was, um, yeah. Yeah, I do right here. Yeah, this the one. Oh, I see. All right, so it's before the split. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. There is, you know, the lot's right there. Right. There's the scale. Right. It's, you know, it's a tenth of a mile. Oh, oh thank you. Of a mile from the sea wall. Where's, here. where's the, where's that old inn that we, right, right here? Yeah, Somewhere? right here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. excellent. All right. So, yep. The only time. Like I said, it was in 78 when there was a little water in the very back right. corner of it. And by the time I got down there the next day, you could see where it had walked in there, but it completely drained out. It never stayed. And as far as water coming off the harbor, the only time I ever remember any water coming it was back in 58. I mean, 53 when the when Hurricane Carroll came through and the water, the wind came across the harbor and blew the tidal surge up on the the Jericho well, Road. Along here, but the water never reached a lot at that point. So, you think the water that you found at, uh, in, in 78 was was rainwater? No, it was stormwater that came down. It was? It ran, ran yeah. down. Because it had that foam in it. Yeah. And it, like I said, it was just in that very back corner. Yeah. And uh, as far as I know, none of the buildings around there had any damage from stormwater at that point. And I. I, I that's the only time we get some water anywhere near there. I think also it didn't flush over it, it just was in that very back corner. I think in 78, too, there was the town drain that backed up for a few days here, mm -hmm. leading outlet. So that, that caused some of the backup. That was the cause of it. Well, I just know my uncle's house is right behind there. Well, you can see the drain. The yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, they he they had water up to his gutters. You know, we were yeah. paying taxes on it. It's a total lot. Yeah. Since back then, we paid the sewer. Uh, uh, when did you pay that? that? What? When, when was that paid? Last? My mother paid that back in the 70s and 80s, which is <laughs> kind of ironic because the first, after I inherited, I was going to build on it. Yeah. Moratorium. And the sewer, sewer moratorium, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> even though we had paid the Benjamin tax. So, but like I said, the, it's never subject to flood. How about the uh, 91 storm? Were what? you there for that? 91, the no-name yeah, or Easter? Yeah, the water, as far as Didn't I Didn't come never, close? Yeah, they never reached it then. Thank you, sir.
Is that it? That's it. Okay. Easy. Frank, do you have any questions? Nope, that was it. Ed, do you have any questions? I'll reserve for public comment. Okay. Good. All right. Is there anyone, uh, a member of the public, that would like to be heard? Uh, yes. Hi. Yes, my name is Carol Walsh. I live at 133 Jericho Road. And that would be uh, right uh, next door? Uh, yes, right behind I have that property. Okay. Um, I have only bought 296A, 296B, um, bought 278 and 279. And I, over time, I've sold it to my daughter and son in law. Left, uh, we subdivided the land up. And I've lived there for 16 years now, and I have never once seen a Mr. Stonefield. Or, 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 are you Mrs. Stonefield? Or, yeah, I've never once seen them on the property. And, you know, I'm right there. Um, that lot, that area does flood, and I don't know. It's flooded on several occasions. Um, it's a total depression there. Um, I, can't, I can't even count all the times it's been flooded in that area. That's what I have to say. And uh, pictures were submitted. The, Showing the lot was. Uh, I'm sorry that the lot. The, the lot yes. does flood indeed. Do you you yeah. submitted pictures? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Shall we see those? <coughs> now, are these photos of your lot or um, the subject lot? Yeah, tell us where, where these pictures are taken from. Actually, <coughs> Suzanne Manko, which I, Hi. I own the property on, of Six Farm Road, and I brought the pictures to Mr. Duggan. And as you can see, um, there is a picture taken from Robert Mahoney's deck. Um, That's from Mr. Mahoney's deck. Yeah, I okay. And th this is years ago. This is prior to my parents did the house over at 133 Jericho 16 years ago. So this is just a regular. Not a big storm, just a regular high tide. What happens is it comes into the marsh way behind and it fills. And as you can see, this is the house on six farm road and the proposed lot is right where the tree is. It was underwater back 16 years ago. This is um, farm road. Jericho Road is taken from it. It was completely, you couldn't pass it. The lot is right where the pole is. In a tree, as you can see, actually, during this storm, the uh, Citrus Fire Department had to rescue my tenants on Six Farm Road because the flooding was so high. This was actually a few hours later. So for, for years, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, there's been flooding where you can't get to the property by motor vehicle. And I think it would definitely be detrimental to have a, build, a whole home there where that property is so wet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir? Uh, Name and address? I yep. five foam road, which even though five and zero don't normally correspond, five is directly across from zero. Uh, that lot has flooded numerous times. Um, two of the pictures you have in front of you uh, show a car, a white car in the driveway. That was my wife's car. That was the Christmas storm two years ago. That car that? was lost in that storm. The car in the driveway immediately next to it was also lost. So that area floods a lot. Um, I was there for the no-name storm. My house, if you look at the elevation of my house across the street, is significantly higher than the lot in question. And three quarters of that lot, my lot, was underwater. Uh, it, it, flooded, it has flooded in, in a few occasions when it has been just heavy rainstorms. It has flooded numerous times over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, Mr. Stonefield said his family goes back to 1953. That house has been in our family, my house, on Five Farm Road since 1947. The lot has been there since 1947. The house wasn't built until 1980. Uh, it has flooded on many occasions. So to think that that's not a flooded area is totally wrong. It floods frequently, not from the harbor across Jericho Road. It comes from the northeast directly across the marsh down on Otis Road in that whole area, comes up across Otis Road through um, the Walsh's property across the street and, and up onto uh, to Foam Road. It goes a little bit up Foam Road also, another couple of houses or so. Uh, the two houses immediately next to this lot in question had significant damages last year. One of them, excuse me, in the Christmas storm, one of them had a watermark on their garage door 22 inches above the ground. 
The other one had water completely fill in their basement right up to above their first step on their front entrance. So if you think that this doesn't flood, that's totally wrong. It has flooded many times over the years. My issue and my question for Mr. Tedeschi is he's going to have to fill that lot significantly if he's going to complete the plan that he wants to build, the house that he wants to build. Even filling that, it's significantly lower than the street, and we already know the street fills at least close to two feet on that storm two years ago. That The water level was above the street. I couldn't get the two cars out during the height of that storm two years ago. It was too late when I got up that, that morning. Uh, and so I had no choice but to move them up further in the driveway and take my chances, and unfortunately one of them uh, we lost. But that whole area is going to ha would have to be filled in significantly, and I'm not sure what the laws are on that of filling wetlands. But to say that it's not a flood area is just totally wrong. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else from the public here to be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Blake Sutherford on Main Road, which was right on the corner of right. okay. and I was uh, I got a notice of the of the hearing. And I just want to say that, you know, I, I'm in the area and I know that, you know, um, I've seen water. I don't get in that, you know, part of the, uh, the neighborhood, but I just know that the, the lot itself, just by me walking around the neighborhood, is, you know, it's just a very unsightly lot. It's overrun by Japanese knotweed. You know, I just walked down this afternoon and, you know, there's, there's bottles and leaves and it looks more like a somewhat of a Kind of like a, a place for refuge, and more of a, you know, just a lot that, you know, that would be, um, you know, better um, left alone. So I'm just in support of uh, developing a lot, and, and I really can't say anything about the flooding. So because I'm not in the direct neighborhood, so. Okay. I'm sorry. Just to make sure I understand, your your position is that you think it would be beneficial to the neighborhood for the lot to be improved? I think it looks a lot better. Right now, like I said, it's filled with Japanese knotweed, which I have on my property, which is just the nastiest, most invasive vegetation. I've been trying to get rid of it. It just goes through your lawn. It goes everywhere. So, you know, it's just, uh, and I'm not really uh, someone that's really pro over development, but, you know, I just think that it's, you know, it would be a lot nicer than just a, you know what it looks like now. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Can I add one more thing? You may. Okay. Uh, also on that lot, we're growing bamboo, all kind of types of wetlands plants back there. I don't know what any of you had. Bamboo is not a wetland plant. There well, is no wetland. There's a, wet, there's a letter from two bonnets that's not a wetland, and that's twice people have said that. I'm sorry. I, 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 this way. This okay, way. sorry. I, I was correcting her that the letter which I left, Mr. Martin, from Mr. Richardson, yes. it was one. Yeah. And, and the second one, well, both people have concluded there are no chapter 131, section 40, prop protected interests on that property. In other words, there are no wetlands. And therefore, it can be filled. And we weren't filling wetlands. Now, you know, here's, here's my, first of all, I have to say how much I appreciate Mr. Richardson's, the use of Mr. Richardson, uh, Mr. Richardson's use of language. It took a while as I had to hack my way through the Japanese <laughs> knotweed and numerous fallen sumac trunks, but, but I finally got to the back of the lot. It was sort of like a safari into jungle, but the good news is that there are no wetlands on the lot. I thought that was good. Here's my problem with the letter. It's dated June 3rd, 2000. It's been updated. I'm just confirming <clears throat> your other botanist's name is Brad Holmes. Brad Holmes confirmed to me today that there's no change in position with respect to there being wetlands or protected interests of any kind under Chapter 131, Section 40 on that piece of land. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's part of the inquiry. That's part of the inquiry. One second. One second. Could I speak to Yes. I, I, I'd just like to speak to the gentleman that was concerned about me filling the land. Uh, I'm only, it's an average of two feet. That's all. It's not like I'm, I'm filling it in. The reason why I did that was just so I could get the uh, slab elevation to 10.6, which is actually out of the floodplain. Right. So well, it's that's more here's floodplain. the here's the problem <clears throat> with the floodplain bylaw. We have a confusion between the use of a static 10-foot elevation in that area, okay, which is a number on a map which is delineated by a line on a map, all right, that may or may not 
have an actual relationship to the fact on the ground of what actually happens. All right, so that there are places where land that is below 10 feet does not flood. There are places where the land is above 10 feet that do flood. And this is the difficulty that we have in trying to interpret apply this bylaw. But the one thing that is that makes it easy to interpret and apply is, is there evidence that the land is in fact subject to flooding? And now we have pictures. The pictures, with respect, to show. the pictures could be anywhere, anytime. In fact, two well, of them. Well, hold on a second. I'm sorry, Richard. Let's address those pictures and tell me why they do not demonstrate well, what it the, is that the, the. That's a winter storm. It could be melted snow. It's, look at the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just look at the Richard, melted come on. Snow. But seriously, look. Yeah. What about it? It's but, it's, but the water is up to the, the hubcap on the car. I might I, I, but, but on whose property is the I mean, I'm, you're talking about a single lot. That's a car on the property. On, on whose on property? Not That's a car property. across, across the, the lot. Street, yeah. I need to have a little bit of uh, the, the order. The issue is, does this lot flood, flood not the neighborhood? Yes. Mm -hmm. So is this, is this the lot? Because this, would be, this evidence would not be admissible. No, no, of course not. Here, here. Where, where well, no, of course not. I, of no, course not. That, no, that's no, well. no, you're right. I mean, I. Well, if it's dated. Uh, all right. Well, uh, well, first of all, we have no standard of admissibility here that's that consistent but with the just, court. I mean, well, the issue is the lot, not the neighborhood. Right. Take that in. No. Okay. Well, we have, we have, we have individuals that have presented these photographs, have given their, they live in the neighborhood, and they have given us their testimony that they have witnessed that this lot floods. Okay. I agree. I heard the testimony, okay. and they, they believe it. I believe they believe it, but okay. this may not be verification of that fact. No, it's my understanding as well that the abutter who submitted these photos with owns the two properties at the corner, Otis Ave and Jericho. <coughs> Those properties are far closer to the ocean and at a much lower elevation. They are this way. At this corner of the property, we're at elevation 10. You can see the grades dropping off to 8 and 7 to that corner. Yeah. And I would presume it continues to drop off. So there would be, I would conclude that there'd be flooding here, the lot that they've been concerned about over the years, prior, before any flooding on this lot. But the, no, one has, no one has given evidence that the, <coughs> no one has one. given evidence that the neighboring lots don't flood. They've not suggested that this is the only lot Ooh, that um, I'm uh, suggesting simply that saying that this lot floods. I'm suggesting that the neighboring lot that they own is close Is the individual that the took these flooded. photographs here the person that took the photographs. Come on up here. Come on up here. All right. I'm sorry, I, you, know, we're this, you know, we really do have to get into this. All right, where are the other photos? My parents bought this house. Hold on, I'm, I'm just gonna ask you a specific question, all right? I want you to tell me, I want you to point to where on this map this photograph was taken from and in what direction. From Robert Mahoney's house, okay, um, which is on Five Farm Road, right. and it's it's his stairs, looking absolutely directly across into that lot. And this is um, my home, which abuts the lot. This is the back. This is the back of this home here. Right. Yes. yes. So the lot is actually this tree is on the lot. Okay. So the so. So the photograph really doesn't. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I'm not, I'm not trying to parse words here, but. This photograph really doesn't show this lot. It suggests that this lot is consistent with what's here. Um, right. I mean, this right? Oh, is that right? No, it's incorrect. All These right. trees are on the lot that they proposed to build. <coughs> They're not on my property. It's six feet from the current lot line. Okay. All right. And where is this photograph and taken that from? That photograph was taken. This, and this is the street is sign for Farm Road. This is Jericho Road. All right. This Pointing in what direction? Road. This tree is on five. All right. So point, but show me where, where, show me where on this map the picture was taken from, and in what direction? Right here. No. This picture oh, that here was taken from Jericho Road, looking directly down. Okay. So where's your house? My, this pole in the tree, and all this brush is the lot. My driveway would be where this bush is here. So this is the street. This pole. is the street. Yes. Okay. And and where would where would this lot where would this lot be? Before or after this? Somewhere in here? It's, it's where the tree is underwater, where all this brush is underwater, right here. 
the large tree, the small tree, the telephone pole, everything, all this is completely underwater. The Citric Fire Department rescued the tenants that were here. Yeah. Because, you know, and okay. they have previously in the past. Too. And the property. So it's not something them. that just happened with the Christmas tree. One at a time. It's sure. been One side, now you'll get your chance, There's Richard. No, you know, it's always flooded. Okay. Could I also well, tell you, the house that was beside that lot, um, Bill, he's not here tonight, Bill Spencer, <coughs> but his whole basement flooded there. All right. So okay. Mr. Also, Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? Yes. I just want to understand the second, the okay. picture you have in your hand right yes. now, this is the Christmas storm? Is that right? Correct. Okay. And the first one that you were showing? Um, this is actually taken when, from Robert Mahoney's lot. I'm just trying to get an idea when it was taken. Well, this, um, my parents bought this house 16 years ago and got uh -huh. it. So it, it had to, it was 16 years ago. Yeah, that was at least 16 years 16 ago. 16 years ago, yeah. okay. Yeah, because my house is totally renovated. And these bushes so. here is, is completely underwater, and that is not my property. That is the lot that Mr. Tedeschi Over proposes on the to left, build on. Correct. On the left of this photo. Yes. Okay. But this, and, this is... This is your house. Yeah, this Correct. This okay. is my home this that is my, my right. mother Carol Walsh bought these, <coughs> this home. Okay. And Completely then you started it up. with Michael Ball did the work, and I purchased this from her okay. years ago. This is a ranch. It's yes. Got a little deck on the front. Correct. And this tree here yeah. and no, I, in this landscaping I'm with this is house the lot. Very well. And, Correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. And that has been remodeled. You may take your seat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One second, guys. Shortly. Shortly. Okay. This one. Richard. No, my, my only, uh, and again, please forgive me for thinking more like a litigator than a zoning one for five minutes. When, when, a, when, a, when a witness right has here. to tell you something's on a wall right. the picture doesn't tell you, that's not a good story. <coughs> so the, the oral testimony that. supporting the picture this is, is, is absolutely right. inappropriate. And secondly, I'm still not convinced that, that, that anything is directly on point on this land. There's nothing that they've shown that's actually physically looking at that piece of land. That's a corner here and a corner there, and they're telling you what's underwater. What is this? Is this the lot? I didn't ask him about that what, picture. What, excuse me, what uh, is Richard, this? Richard, 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 Richard please, Sorry, please. Yeah. You're, you're not on stage here. Yeah, yeah. See, no, take a look. This is the lot. Oh, no, this no, is no, the no, 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 we will not do that. We will not do this. We will not do this, all right? We do not engage in back and forth between uh, applicants and, and uh, members of the public. My, my only comment is, I'm yet, I'm yet <coughs> to be convinced that anything is pointed out on this lot, and, and moreover. Well, you're, they, you're standing there, I'm sitting here. I understand that. Okay. But moreover, if one has to explain something's on water and the future doesn't show it, it doesn't have a lot of value. I appreciate that. Okay, that's a, that's a lawyer's argument. Appreciate that. Good argument. <laughs> yes. Uh, can I add I think it's important to point out that this house will be constructed on tiles. It's on a full foundation, and therefore it really will not affect the, um, the drainage. Water can continue. In, it's a must. It, would, it, will not, it will not affect the drainage path. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that this, pro this project will require the approval of either the planning board or the conservation for the stormwater permit. And that permit will, will be designed and, and approved um, in order to ensure that the rate and volume of runoff Exiting the site will not be greater in the, in the post conditions. So they'll have to do um, provide um, subsurface um, recharge, trenches, whatever it takes to ensure that the rate of runoff on your property here or this property is, is not increased. All right. Can I make one more note? That the, the first floor elevation of the house is actually at 18 6. I was going to point that out. It's you mean on the pilings? Yes. On the pilings. Yeah. Well, that's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the current elevation right. of the lot. Yeah, you know, the only reason I, what made me want to say the same thing as someone mentioned about houses being flooded, this right. will not be a house that's flooded. Well, I understand. I appreciate that. That was that. the only reason. I, Richard, I appreciate what you're saying more than you know. Right. Because less than a year ago, we denied a woman the right to build a house on her property uh, for, for less reason. All right? For less reason. And it still hurts. Right. Okay. So I under I appreciate your position more than you know. I would like to what what I would like to do now right. is have you guys relax right. for a second, and let Frank, who's been chomping at the bit. No, here, no, I'm not chomping at it. <laughs> go ahead, Frank. I, I'm I'm interested to hear what the rest of you all have to say. I I, I did not bring my bylaws with me. Uh, could you? Um, 
and if I, I know the instance that you're referring to. Can, what is the standard as about flooding? Okay. Um, uh, Section 470.9. This is uh, on the floodplain special permit provision. It says Section 470.9 says, if any land in the floodplain and water pr watershed protection district is proven to the satisfaction of the Board of Appeals as being in fact not subject to flooding and not unsuitable because of drainage conditions for any use otherwise permitted under the applicable provisions of the bylaw, we may issue a special permit for the proposed use. Now, the way that we applied this bylaw the last time was because we messed it up the first time. There are essentially two votes taking place here. One is a determination of whether or not it's in fact subject to flooding. Mm -hmm. And we interpreted that to be a vote that required a, a, a bare majority, which is two to one. The special permit um, requirement, uh, then if we vote that it is not in fact subject to, to uh, flooding, then we vote to uh, whether or not to issue a special permit for the use, which is <coughs> a three nothing vote, a unanimous vote. So um, when, when it is in the flood, it, when it's in the floodplain, we have to determine that it is not in fact not subject to flooding. And our, you know, our, our position the last time was, was that a lot that has occasional overwash um, in the event of an unusual storm, um, that occasional overwash does not constitute flooding. Um, that position did not carry. Uh, and, and here we are, I mean, I, I, you know, and I have to say, I saw this coming when, 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 uh, when we had this argument before because that was, a, that was a beachfront lot that sat on the top of a toe of a dune. And, and it wasn't too long after, you know, that entire neighborhood was under four feet of water because of the breach, um, when was it, it was less, when was that? I mean, it was- 91. Like, but the lot in question- No, 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 I mean, I'm talking about oh, that in the last but the couple of years. the in question yeah. was not under water. It wasn't. No, Everything it wasn't. Everything around it was, but it Everything, was not. Exactly. It and, had and, water and yet, go over it. And yet here is this huge <laughs> swath of that neighborhood, which because of the peculiar um, uh, uh, topography, um, does, you know, get this occasional, um, uh, you know, uh, unusual flooding. And, and in, in, in if the bylaw was interpreted as uh, consistently as it had been um, uh, before, um, any undeveloped lot in that, uh, in that area would be undevelopable. It would be worth zero. And yet here we have a person who's uh, paid a betterment and, and, um, and paid uh, taxes on a developable lot for 20, 30 years. Right. So, you know, it's a, this is a difficult situation. Can, can I ask you, if I may interrupt just for a second, Please. you said there was an issue where you were right and then you were wrong, which sounds like a yes. physical statement. Yeah. What, well, tell me, what is the context of that statement? What do you mean you were right and then you were wrong? Well, the context was that, that we, we initially we took a vote. Okay. Uh, and the vote was two to one, two in favor of it being found not to be subject to flooding. Because we thought that the original vote was, had to be unanimous, we then concluded that, well, the fact that it only got two to one instead of three to nothing, second, oh, right, we, nothing. We, did, you know, we thought that the, right. the fight was over. Okay. Right. I just wondered, has anyone ever, and I just the thought of this just, Really bothers me. Has everyone ever written a legal opinion on the on the legal construction of occasional flooding? Because I know that if you look long enough, you will find. <coughs> All right. Which is it? Before we dealt with this, this was the second special permit application right. for this property. Before we dealt with it, the planning board had already once denied it, and that had been litigated. We read the entire trial transcript right. before the land court, which included. 80 pages of expert testimony from two experts. Right. Um, and uh, in, in terms of, yeah, there were two legal opinions, diametrically opposed. Oh, opposed, yeah, <laughs> that figures. I just, um, 
I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critically important passage because whenever you're talking about it, you're talking about some valuable real estate, yes. obviously. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> could, could, I, could I make just one note as well? Yes. The title uh, gates that we just put in in the past few years, that's deviated. It, it, it doesn't flood that anymore. Those pictures were all years ago. After. I'm sorry, when were the pictures taken? The December, uh, December uh, of 2000. Christmas storm a little less than two years ago, and the ones with the white car in there, that car was lost in that storm. That was after those floodgates were repaired. Okay. So that was less than two years ago. And that, that is upstream, if you will, of the flooding as it comes across the marsh from Otis Road and that whole area. Yep. We're on the far end of it. We're about as far away from the, the ocean as you can get us in terms of the flooding. We still lost the car. So how those lots all around it could be underwater, but this one in the middle is not, just does not make sense. All right, Frank, do you have any other? Uh, so uh, re having read this, it, uh, and I, I just had in mind your reference to occasional, it said, this says, as I read it, is being, in fact, not subject to flooding. Right. Not, so if we find the, the issue, the, and I, I, I take it that <coughs> you said there's a preliminary finding that we need to make. Right. Is this lot subject to flooding? Yes. Period. Right. And, and it is. And then after that, then, if, if we find that it's not subject to flooding, then we can address the next question. Then we, then we vote to determine whether or not the special permit criteria can be applied to this lot as, as it's uh, proposed to be built on. Because now, I, I, now okay. what is, in fact, you know, what is, in fact, subject to flooding mean? You know, is, is occasional, does, does the occasional overwash constitute flooding? Um, you know, that's, you know, certainly a question that, we're able to uh, to interpret and apply in a reasonable manner. There's no one answer to it. I don't believe that there's uh, any one answer to it. Anyway, um, we're going to engage a little. Ed, what do you have? Uh, what are your thoughts and concerns? <coughs> well, main, my main concern is um, the bylaw, <coughs> because I do think we have a situation where we have reasonable we property that could be reasonably developed and this is an, ex an example of it understand that oftentimes what we're looking at is can a pro can a structure be built to withstand storms and surge we have properties on the water subject to storm surge subject subject to property subject to flooding on a regular basis but because they were built once before it's not a problem as long as the structure is built to, to withstand that type of situation I mean, look at the buildings that have been rebuilt on uh, Town Way over the years. Look at the property um, all along Surfside Road. Every one of those lots on Surfside Road is subject to flooding under this interpretation. Um, and all along Oceanside Drive, with the exception of just about 4th Ave, where it goes up higher and then go drops down again. Um, what we're doing is condemning a lot, which um, a completely reasonable structure could be built upon that would not change the water running onto any of the neighboring lots, would not change this situation at all. Um, I'm very comfortable that this shows what it shows. Uh, and it shows that this lot is underwater, and therefore it is flooding. It, it also shows that Jericho Road is high and dry, which it, at this time and throughout this storm, it was there. Just further down, in front of the yacht club, it was underwater at the end of uh, Wellesley Road um, Beacon. But Jericho tends to stay high there because the water's not coming from the beach across from Foam Road. It's coming from up and behind and coming across Otis and that the lowlands back there. So I, I really think this property could be developed. I think it could be de developed nicely. I think it would be an improvement to the neighborhood. Um, I, I think it meets all the criteria, but I'm afraid we won't be able to vote on it because uh, we will probably not get past the, is the land subject to flooding? Well, I have an idea on that, but let's get to that in a second. John, what do you have to, what do you have to say? I'm kind of stuck on the same thing. Is the land subject to flooding? All right. Yeah. But 
Well, go ahead. No, sure. but just to say a lot of the land is yeah. around there, you know. What are the eleva elevation? Well, if it's along that line, your your lot floods. Well, only occasionally, like only that. Case. So I think I'll your develop lot, those two your lots. Your lot doesn't flood because it's further above it. But 479, five, five. it does flood, and it has flood, no, and it I'm provides asking, the board I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Does your lot flood? Yes. Yes. Occasionally. Um, five foam. Yes, on occasion. The property that your that your mother sold off in front, behind the fence, where the big dog is. That floods. I don't want to speak for... Um, is, that, is that owner here? Yes. You get water on that in that yard? Five Otis, I'm, I'm right behind it. It, it floods, absolutely floods. Uh, five Otis, you're the, that's, you're the house that's... My house is about to step backyard. It's the new house that's raised up? Yeah. And I assume it was raised when it was rebuilt. <laughs> Construction uh, criteria. Correct, but it, during the Christmas storm, it certainly flooded down. With. Again, I'm only su suggesting that there are all these houses around it that they're land floods, but the houses are perfectly habitable and right. and very nice. I, I have to disagree. Go ahead. Hi, um, we're at Ten Bone Road and our Deborah Arlauskas, A R L A U S K A S, and our whole basement was flooded. Our first floor. The first floor was all flooded. Let me ask you a question. Uh, for those of you that, that, that do live in the neighborhood and live with occasional flooding, yeah. do you mm -hmm. store home possessions in your basement? This is the first, do you this is the first floor living area. It, it, it's a garage and first floor living area. The whole thing was underwater, four feet of water. Okay. And we have the insurance bills, anything you need to see. All right. No, well, I'm just, but you, but you live with it. You have, you have, uh, you have, how long have you lived in your properties? Since 1997. Okay. I've lived there 16 years. So okay. All right. All right. So you deal with the occasional flooding as it occurs. And mm -hmm. You're still there. Do you live there full time? Okay. All right. Neil, do you have something to say? Just um, an I observation. Kind of and I think. And I agree with that on this bylaw. And, and, the re and I just want to clarify for folks, you know, who may be watching this on TV later and folks in the room, that the reason that houses can be reconstructed uh, along the waterfront on similar lots and lots that are in the velocity zone is because the bylaw allows it, uh, allows for uh, pre existing structures to be reconstructed. That is the reason. Uh, they are not put to the same test as a vacant lot is. Um, and just an observation on this, um, I think any time you have a lot such as this in, in a federal floodplain, the burden of proof is on the applicant. Um, and I know the neighbors provided a lot of evidence, but I think, I think it's a tall mountain to climb, frankly. Um, and it is in the um, federal floodplain. It is just on the edge of the town, the Citroën floodplain, and the contours of the lot uh, well below 10 feet. So. I guess uh, you're going to take right. you're going to lead us to the altar and then not marry. So you're going to give us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get. I guess the other uh, um, quick point I wanted to make is on that prior application too. I think the board went with the FEMA um, definition of flooding, which uh, includes overwash. That was an AO zone, wave overwash zone. There was no standing water on that lot. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at the dictionary definition of flooding, uh, it, you know, it, it pretty much standing water. So, so. Well, I, we, we certainly agree on that. I mean, we agree that the, well, I'm not going to make any editorial comments. Okay. Well, here's, here's, uh, here's the position that we're in. All right. And, um, this my from my perspective, right? Um, one of the things that uh, one of the grave duties that we do as a board here is that we have to interpret and apply this zoning bylaw, right? But we don't get the you know the freedom to interpret and apply it any way we we wish to. We we have to interpret and apply it not just to so that it's consistent with the language that's used in the bylaw, which. It, which is the problem that we've been discussing for the last 40 minutes. But we also have to interpret and apply it 
um, in a manner that is consistent with the property owner's constitutional right not to be deprived of the use of his property, right? Now, uh, that, um, <coughs> that is, you know, it's a, it's a grave responsibility for us. If we sit here and say, no, you cannot build on your property, there is nothing else that can be done with that property. If there, the, the way that the, the evaluation of the constitutional issue is, we deny this person a right to build a house on it, well, what else can he do? Can he do anything permissible under the zoning bylaw that provides that property with some economic value? Is there anything that can be done with that property that provides the owner the right to some economic value? And unless somebody can convince me, you know, that can, can point something out to me that I, I don't see, um, I don't know how we can apply this bylaw in a manner that doesn't completely obliterate all of this man's property rights uh, and make his property worthless. Now, what, is, what happens when that occurs? Laying aside the fact that he's been paying taxes on it as a developable lot and, and paid betterments over the years, um, he comes back to the town of Situate and says, you took my property and you have to pay me for it. Uh, because, because that's what the Constitution requires be done. Uh, and so that's a consideration that we have to, you know, that we have to look at when we, um, uh, when we look at applying the bylaw to this piece of property. So, uh, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm, I, I, I'm not sure that I can say uh, in, in a neighborhood in which, you know, the proposal is to, uh, is to elevate the property um, out of the floodplain and place it on piling so that, you know, demonstrably, if it's consistent with, with uh, the DEP and um, uh, uh, if FEMA, this FEMA doesn't have any jurisdiction. Uh, yes, they do. Okay. So, I mean, here's, um, you know, this, this property owner is going to have to obtain permits from all kinds of other uh, government agencies that are going to have to be satisfied that this property is going to be safe to live in. Uh, probably safer to live in than some of your houses because it has to be built on pilings and, and it, has to, uh, it has to meet a code that wasn't in existence when your homes were built. Uh, and I have a real problem um, uh, uh, applying this bylaw to a man that says he can't do that. Um, uh, and his property is worthless. So that's my, that's my concern. Yes, sir. If I could, Steve Dior, <clears throat> if you take it the way that you're stating it right now, that would mean that anybody that was in the floodplain that flooded, if you couldn't build a single family home, you couldn't apply bylaw. Uh, if, if, if there was no other permissible use under the bylaw, now this is what I say, uh, the permissible uses by special permit. Uh, a duck blind, a facility for the study of nature, <laughs> and a dock. Well, I'm somewhat familiar with those. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you'd have a lot of trouble selling a, do a space on, the, on a dock <laughs> in, the, in the middle of that. Spot. Flower or vegetable gardens. But occasionally, occasionally you get a thing out. <laughs> Temporary storage of materials or equipment, dams, excavations, changes in water course to create ponds. That's ironic. Non residential structures used in con only in conjunction with fishing, shell fishing, or the growing, harvesting, or storing of crops raised on the premises. I think you can make a lot of money raising a crop on a 5,000 square foot lot. I mean, that, you know, this is, this is how we have to apply this bylaw. What are the other uses that are permissible under the bylaw, and, and are any of them reasonable, you know, are they, <coughs> do, they, do they provide the property owner with any um, effective use of his property? <coughs> Does anybody else have anything to say? Sure. Can I ask you a question? Sure. 
question? Yes. Questions you. are always allowed. All right. I'll bring it up to you. This is interesting. When I purchased these properties, that was a 5,000 square foot lot. That was a 5,000 square foot lot. This was the old um, boathouse for situate lock on number 27 that from the Nancy Main Society. The structure was there. Oh, okay. There was a house in that lot that they moved. Is this going to gonna, is this going to relate? To, is this going to yes. be relevant so to this? It, it actually will. Cause I, I, was, I sat on the board at the time. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't allowed to develop those two lots, even though they were both five thousand and they were in the flood zone. I was told no. So therefore, I to make it work, um, I had to have some statute changed, and I subdivided it so each property would have over ten thousand square feet. So now, I think we should, since it's called a condominium, revert it back, and then I can build a 5,000 square foot house on this 5,000. No, but that, no, but that, that isn't why you were denied the opportunity to build on those lots. Okay. All right, we're talking about a... Flood zone. No, it, but we're talking flood zone here. What you're talking about is the fact <laughs> that you were undersized lots, and they were owned That's jointly. Okay, all right, all right. We're, we're talking contiguously, so they were joined. No, we're, it's we're a whole other story. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Game effort, though. <laughs> well, this is Joe, so I'm not trying. And, and I think I think on that application we we worked out a very good compromise for you because you had setback issues and everything else in order to try to get the two properties. It, well, get it, the properties. It was separated. an eighty-one L, I believe. Yeah. It was an eighty-one L uh, division. Yeah. All right. I'm, a, I'm a, a questions that are relevant to this application and property only. Yes. Sure, and you just spoke about um, how the land, you may not be able to do anything with it. Yep. Unfortunately, it's in a flood zone. Force, you know, it's in a flood zone, and unfortunately, it, it does flood. And we've, been, we've given you pictures uh, are to we, show that it is flooded. Are we talking, so are we, are we making? you can't do anything with this land, you can't do anything with this land. I own several lots in Stitcher where we pay taxes on that we can't develop, and it is what it is. But it's in a flood zone, we've provided you pictures of it flooded. So I just want the board to Appreciate take that into that. consideration. The job is, does it flood? Yes, we we'll show that. Okay, it we're we're uh, thank we're you. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 is there anybody with factual information and not argument? We understand what the issues are. We have to deal with. Okay, all right. So I'm going to close the public portion of this hearing. Does uh, Mr. Henderson have anything further to offer on his applicant's behalf? Only. Um, well, um, I, I, I'm thinking, um, I, I, no, no evidence other than I might want to do a memo, but I, I'll let you guys proceed. Well, um, but I, I, in, I in, in like view of the fact that, you know, there's competing evidence here as to whether or not the land, the, the lot floods, do you want more time to develop that aspect of the application or, uh, or not? That's a difficult question because I can't read your mind, so. Um. I was pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And I thought Peter was too. I, um, I don't know whether you need any 80 more pages of, of expert testimony. Um, it, it's kind of a, a funny expression to deprive someone their, for, to the use of their land. I mean, everything's entitled, I mean, everything. In any storm, you, you likely get some accumulation of water on someone's property in a flood zone or not. Um, so, it, I don't know what it means occasional. I mean, I don't know if it means subject to flooding, so it does damage, subject to flooding, so it's just water. It isn't clear the magnitude from those two words. I agree. So, therefore, to deprive someone to their private property rights on two simple words that are not elaborated on in any way in the bylaw, I seem as it's, it's just fundamentally unfair. And it, I mean, the English language is pretty clean, uh, pretty clear. I mean, something that said, but everything's subject to flooding in some respect. It seems to me that subject to flooding in some way that doesn't harm. It doesn't say that, but it's obviously the intent. The mere accumulation of water that doesn't result in harm to someone, or, 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 or and one of the main concerns about flooding today in, in the FEMA context is they don't want to be paying government money to save houses that can't be rebuilt, but this. Clearly, it's a house that's never going to be it's the whole point of complying with all current building standards for <coughs> zone housing. So this is probably less likely to be harmed than any other house in the neighborhood. So the mere use of two words without any other context 
to deprive someone seems to me to be wholly inappropriate. Is it possible that there's that you might find something that's more persuasive than ad hoc argument? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I can't. I, I mean. Well, let's uh, let's leave it this way. I, I, I the, your, uh, I mean, I, there's evidence and there's there's legal argument, right? Uh, and um, you're certainly free to to uh, develop and present um, in writing, you know, your analysis of uh, floodplain special permit bylaws, this language, uh, the case law that's an interpreter implied. I mean, there's some, you know, there's, there are cases oh, on I know that. The, the, the other thing is, I don't mean, I mean it from the bottom of my heart, I'm not being a wise guy. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but those photographs are not great evidence either. All right, I, all right. I don't know We've what, heard that. We've heard no, that. I know that, but my point is. I know what your to point to is. Don't, you're not going to get anywhere wrong. You have to work with some facts, that's yeah. all. Well, I mean, I, you know, look, uh, yeah, I mean, and testimony I, is facts, right? There, there, are, there, are, there, there is more than one person here I understand who, whose that. testimony think, is worth I, something. I understand. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything other than it's difficult to understand the magnitude, and therefore to make that argument based on those pictures, that's all. I, I, can, I can make an evaluation based on personal experience. My brother lives in the neighborhood not far up the street. I'm a frequent visitor to the neighborhood for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I understand the topography of the land and I do understand how, it, how the water flows there. I don't think that, I don't think the pictures are misleading. No, no, I don't suggest no, they're misleading. I'm but, just but suggesting it, they're not but, that helpful. But when it Depends on what the definition of well, flooding is. Like, so precisely. the flooding is, that's the challenge we're, that we're faced with. Could I just make one quick note? And, uh, but but your, this, your, the property owner behind you has actually raised his hand. Go ahead. Um, I, I understand your, your dilemma. I serve on the, I have for a number of years on the other side of the table myself. I, not ZBA, but conservation of my, in my own hometown. And I know where you're at when you, when, you, when you have to make a tough decision. And I understand that. But, I, know, I also understand what a taking means. And denying me any use of my land in any definition is a taking. And you know, it, I appeal to you, don't take it, please. <coughs> there was certainly case law that says, zoning case law, not eminent domain case law, that said in certain, there's two variance cases, one in Worcester and one in Brookline, I think, that hold it, I think one of them is actually Plymouth case, saying that depriving someone of the use of the land itself, just not being able to do anything itself, constitutes, meets the standard of hardship and the variance criteria, which I don't want to go through. Well, uh, here, look, let me ask you a question. Why don't you file an, an application for variance? Oh, God. I mean, I've, you know, I don't, I, you know. Topography of the lot. Yeah. Um, Um, so that, are you suggesting that relieves you of your, it doesn't relieve you, but it, it exacerbates it. That's something different of us. Well, it asks us to do something different. I mean, first of all, I, you know, let's, 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 I, I have a, I have a suggestion. Why doesn't someone make a motion? We're, we have two votes to take here, right? One is to determine what the, opinion of the, the board is on whether or not it is in fact subject to flooding. We take a vote on that and, and the, the determination is that it is in fact subject to flooding, then the application, you know, is effectively denied and if Mr. Henderson wishes to come back with an application for a variance, then we can consider it at that time. Just, just want you to know that next week I'm starting a trial of a zoning case that I presented seven years ago. It went from the zoning board, it's exactly the same thing. They made a vote and they decided to come back and treat it a different way. It is the worst thing I've ever involved in my life. I'm actually starting in the Spirit Court after the desk go, you know, Spirit Court, Appeals Court, SJC, back again, two zoning cases, five motions for reconsideration. On the issue was exactly this, that they had to take a preliminary, make a preliminary finding and they did. And then they allowed 
withdrawal without prejudice, but they filed a decision, and it was argued that when we came back six months later, it was a repetitive petition, when we came back a month later. So I want to make sure that if, if you should make such a vote, that before you go to your vote, we can withdraw without prejudice, because therefore, we're not prevented from coming back tomorrow. But if you should actually determine it's flooding and then vote, let me come back. I can't come back for 24 months, and that's totally. Un I don't want to do that. Well, so if you if you if you should determine as a preliminary step that it might be subject to flooding, um, I can. I, most boards will let you withdraw before you reach a final decision. Well, that's what that's that's what that's what, that's what Ms. Doherty did. And uh, you know, in terms of uh, at least my 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 uh, understanding or interpretation of how the, this particular uh, process works is until we take a final vote, the applicant <coughs> is free to request uh, <coughs> the application be withdrawn. And once it's withdrawn, <coughs> we don't have any jurisdiction or authority to write a decision. Okay, that, and that's where Greg Hassan made <coughs> wrote the decision anyway, even though it was withdrawn without prejudice and not so created. <coughs> Let me ask you a couple of other questions. Um, and maybe this is fair because it's clearly something you can't ask someone on his board, but I heard you really saying two things. I heard you suggesting, based on the photographs, that there's some flooding. Whether that meets the definition of subject to flooding is what you're going to discuss. But I also sense that even if you thought there was flooding, there might be other overriding conditions that would be more persuasive than that. Is, was that the direction you were going? <laughs> That's well, I mean, I, I look. Let's let's. Why don't, why don't you just have your discussion and let me? Let's 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 see if there's someone on the board that wants to make a motion uh, on this on the first uh, the first issue that we have to consider, can, and then we'll can see. I, can I go to the bullpen between votes here and talk to my? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, I'll let you talk, and then I might want to recess just to talk to some people about it. That's all. All right, well, uh, we have to get somebody to make a motion first. Does Mr. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in the absence of uh, Sarah, um, the three people uh, sitting on this application that are uh, voting are myself, Mr. Hallam, and, and uh, Mr. Tibbetts. So. Moves that the board find that the land, um, the land in question at seven, at zero, uh, zero foam? Who said zero, zero foam road zero foam. Is, uh, is subject to flooding. Second by Mr. Hanley. All right. Um, so a a a, a yay vote is uh, is uh, a, a yay vote is to suggest that that um, the property that a special a floodplain special permit may not be uh, issued to the property. Correct. Right. Okay. Well, discussion. What is subject to flooding? And that's, that's the gist of the issue. Um, it would appear to me that this property, it's been demonstrated, and I have personal experience to believe that the property does have standing water occasionally in extremes of weather. Not, not regular flooding, not tidal flooding, not subject to flooding as a result of heavy rains, but significant weather conditions. And I think that's why insurance companies have rules about granting insurance to properties within a mile of the ocean, no matter what topography they're on, because the ocean changes and we get weather, which causes very unusual circumstances. Is that subject to flooding? Or is that subject to extreme weather conditions? 
Are you going to answer that? I'd like to argue that it's subject to extreme weather conditions. What, but the question I'm ha asking the board is what, what I know what we, decisions that have been made in the past, um, which I wasn't wholeheartedly in favor of, um, because I don't think subject to flooding means subject to extreme weather. <coughs> but I'd need to have more persuasive evidence that the only water that we're talking about here is because it's subject to extreme weather. The only evidence before us is standing water as a result of extreme weather. Well, you're suggesting that, that uh, in the face of the limited evidence that they're, they're, it's subject to standing water and extreme weather, that the applicant hasn't carried his burden of demonstrating that it isn't, that, that there isn't flooding in other than extraordinary conditions? Well, the applicant's, the applicant's professional testimony is that the contours of the land and the contours of surrounding land suggest that this land would not be the first area to flood if there were regular, reasonable conditions of flooding. But evidence shows that it is subject to flooding in extreme weather conditions. You should be a lawyer. <laughs> John, you what's, your, uh, <laughs> what's your... Uh, I teach seventh grade. That's harder to debate sometimes. <laughs> That's hard enough. Yeah, I, I think we're still stuck, well, not stuck, but, but uh, kind of that definition of uh, subject to flooding. Is it uh, extreme weather conditions over there? We're not worried about the harm to the neighbors. But well, I guess, I, uh, John, uh, you've been on, you've been serving on town boards here for a long time. What's it, give me, give us the benefit of your years <laughs> of experience here, Frank. What's, uh, what are you thinking? I, I, my, my, I agree with you all that, that, that I'm not a big fan of the way this bylaw is written. But I think it was written for a reason. And uh, we grandfather houses that exist and let them stay. Um, and we are discouraging, the town is discouraging, and the federal government does the same thing, discouraging homes that are in these areas that are, are you know, uh, subject to flooding and, and subject to emergency situations. And, uh, and so I think the town made a judgment when it passed the bylaw that it didn't want to increase the problem of having to rescue people in the middle of storms and things like that. And uh, so that, that's the reason for it. I do think it's very unfair, particularly in a case like this where, where a man's been paying taxes for a, for a buildable lot and paid the sewer betterments and, and things like that. But the, the, the language of the bylaw is, is to me, pretty clear, and I think there's a public policy reason for it. And so I was intrigued by your constitutional law argument, but um, didn't think I'd be. And now I, I, I'm not deciding, I guess. I'm not a Supreme Court justice uh, uh, for I'll purposes send you the of this, cases. but you are. Yeah. Well, uh, just uh, as a matter of clarification, this and this was uh, this was the evidence uh, on this bylaw that was presented in the in the Doherty case. Uh, it's my understanding that the language of this bylaw is is identical to the language uh, of the zoning bylaws in every uh, almost you know practically every community in Massachusetts that has such a bylaw, uh, and and uh, it's language that hasn't changed in over 25 years or, I mean, a, a, a substantial length of time. So while, um, while I'm always, uh, you know, it's, you always hear that language about the, um, you know, the intent of town meeting and um, the legislative <coughs> intent, et cetera. And um, as a practical matter, I, I really don't think that the town meeting that adopted this particular bylaw, when it adopted it, was really thinking that much about what the practical implications of it were um, at the time that they passed it. And we had a lengthy, you know, uh, argument uh, over the over a period of months um, um, as to 
you know, whether uh, this bylaw should be interpreted um, as of the date that it was enacted, uh, adopted, or whether it should be interpreted as of the date of today, given the changes in technology and, and you know, <coughs> and building, uh, uh, you know, methods and materials and, and, and the enormous advancement of uh, the federal uh, regulations, which specify to an enormous, uh, you know, uh, degree, how to build a house in an environment like this. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I never really quite got past the point of, well, if, if this is not supposed to be buildable land, why is the federal government telling you how to build a house on it and then giving you a permit for it? And then after an individual goes and gets all these permits and comes to us, and we say, well, it's subject to flooding. You know, there was a storm there 15 years ago, and it, and it flooded, so you know, your permits are no good. Now, fortunately for Mr. Henderson and his clients, they haven't spent all that money you know, and all that time to come here and be, and be told no. Um, but, I, you know, my, you know, so, you know, I don't. I don't buy. I, I can't buy into the argument that this bylaw compels this board to deny a property owner the right to build a, a house on a on a lot that um, has standing water at it uh, on it after hurricane or after winter storm. I, I can't. I can't do that. Um, I, I just. It's. It's. Um, it's antithetical to my understanding of property rights. So. Any further discussion? Any? No. All right. So the motion that's made and seconded is to find that the, the land is in fact subject to flooding. So a yes vote is in favor of saying that the land is subject to flooding. A no vote is to say that the land is not subject to flooding. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. 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 All right, so it's a 3 0 vote to, in effect, say that the land is not, in fact, subject to flooding. All right, now. Now. We have. For those who chose to stay, I'd like to just make an editorial comment. If you don't think, if you don't feel that the board is challenged by this and using our best effort to preserve citizens' property rights, remember, most of you are property owners. And if you we're challenged by this every day, every time we meet. And our, our job is to preserve your rights to the best of our ability. All right, so the second. The special permit. Yeah, the special permit requirements. I'm sorry, I'm just having a little. I'm, I'm distracted by the door slamming episode. On the, on section 900. Um, if you bear with me here. On section 960. 950.3. Nine, 9 right? My eyesight's terrible. 950.3 is correct. Right. I also, yeah, I think, I think that's what we're left with now after you. Yes. And so I, I think I already dealt with them. One, that the specific site is an appropriate location for the use or structure. That's an easy one. It's a single family neighborhood. It's appropriate. It's not as if we're asking to put a gas station. We're asking to put a single family home. I don't know what could be more appropriate. Um, it's, a, it's a house that complies with all federal and state requirements for building in this type of zone. So I think that's not a difficult one to overcome. It will not adversely affect the neighborhood. Nothing that's being done in terms of the height of the house, the stormwater management considerations, 
the setback requirements that will in any way affect or be detrimental to this neighborhood. I reiterate that it's an ugly vacant lot. It's going to be an attractive home, respectful of all side yard setbacks and rear setbacks with a stormwater management system and built on pilings to avoid exacerbating any flooding conditions. So I don't see any adverse effect on the neighborhood. Nuisance hazard of vehicle pedestrians, it's, it's not an attraction, it's not a gymnasium, it is not a store, it is not a thing that would attract undue pedestrian or vehicular traffic that would in any way be detrimental to the neighborhood. It would have no more effect than any other single family home in a neighborhood and that's cars going out three or four times a day from a driveway. Again, I do not see how um, in any way vehicular or pedestrians that will be brought to this site by one single family home will cause undue nuisance or serious hazard <coughs> in the neighborhood. Adequate and appropriate facility will be provided to ensure the proper of the proposed use. And I always just address, when you have a house, you have to have a septic system or a sewer. You have to have utilities. You have to comply with setback requirements. You have to comply with safety standards in terms of the construction of the house, the driveway. So there's nothing that would be done that would have a significant impact in any way or that would result in the improper use of the property. It will be complying with state and federal building codes. Um, and it cannot be significant impact in water supply. It's a single family house. Again, it's not a facility that uses gallons and gallons. It's not a restaurant. It's not a hotel. It's, it's a single family home. So all of those conditions, it's hard to find that you don't meet them when what you're doing is what's permitted in the neighborhood, and that is a single family home. So I don't, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I can't imagine any circumstances where a single family home would violate these conditions. Anything? I agree. No. Good. Mm -hmm. Frank. Well, I suppose the uh, the uh, uh, the advocate against the application would um, would say that the filling of the addition of two feet of fill to raise that portion of the structure out of the floodplain would uh, increase the likelihood that the um, that when flooding occurs that uh, that the displacement of of, uh, of that water to a neighbor's property would uh, adversely affect the, the neighbors yeah, that, that, and uh, that portion of the of the flood zone is a flood zone ae and it's associated with the coastal resource and um therefore um you do not have to provide compensatory storage for work for fill within a flood zone when it's associated with a coastal resource. The assumption is that the ocean is infamous and um, and that it's subject to tidal action. The storm flow comes in and out, and um, and that small amount of fill would not affect the ocean in a whole. And uh, and the argument about uh, undue. A nuisance or serious hazard um, that would result may result from an additional dwelling being in a position where under unusual circumstances uh, it would add to the <coughs> the uh, burden of on uh, emergency personnel emergencies uh, rescue you know that type of thing um. My, my immediate reaction to that is that would probably they'll be the last house they went to because it's the one that's flood com flood compliant and less likely to have residents or occupants in serious danger from flood waters and therefore less likely to need to be evacuated. Also, the limit of the fleet FEMA zone um, AE elevation ten. The elevation ten corridor runs right here. Um, this is a ten scale ten scale plan, so that's only. 15 feet or so away from the dwelling, the limit of the flood zone. Okay. Um, you know, um, I closed the public portion of, of the meeting, but um, with without objection, I'm going to reopen it uh, to entertain that gentleman's question. Without uh, objection. I'm, I'm objection. a tribal historian, which is a very impressive. How can a two-foot grade not affect 
two feet above my backyard. How, how is that not possible? How is that possible that that could possibly work? The idea is if the el the flood element, if a flood a storm flows all the way way to here, it's coming from over here, um, the salt water, the, the tidal resource, and that's associated with the ocean. And there's plenty of room for displacement going uh, within the ocean. Neil, uh, Neil has. Some I, I wasn't going to bring this up um, because I didn't anticipate this outcome. But um, four seventy point seven prohibited uses, dumping, filling, uh, transfer of any material which would reduce the natural storage capacity of the land is prohibited. So how do we get around that? <coughs> the four seventy point seven. Well, then it also goes on. Um, will it interfere with the natural drainage patterns? No, it won't. No, it doesn't. That's not um, my question. My question is the first sentence. It will not reduce the storage capacity of the land because right. that is not an inland resource area. It's so a, if you put a, a tidal resource. No, area. this is in the zoning bylaw. So if you put a concrete pad on that, you're going to reduce the natural storage capacity of the land, no? Um, yeah, the pad, the pad will be below the house. And, uh, we're going and, to and be just, I, I think this should be directed at the board because I think it's kind of in the board's hands right now, yeah. so how they interpret it. And we're going to provide a groundwater recharge for the roof runoff. I think his question was on the fill excavation. So uh, Mr. Mr. Duggan is of the opinion that 470.7 would, in every case uh, of a of uh, uh, of a proposed building in a floodplain or watershed protection district, uh, no filling of uh, uh, at all would be permissible, even if the structure itself was. I, I would say you could do gravel or something. Um, what, what difference does it make whether it's gravel or sand? Well, it doesn't reduce the natural storage capacity of land if you use gravel. But I think what, what I think. Really, the only reason I brought this up, I don't want to be dealing with this down the road when they have a special permit to do something and, you know, you have a, another section is, is, you know, contradicting what the special permit is. What is the, what, 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 what do you fill with? May I just address, Jeff, yes. before I get to it? It, it isn't abstract. It says um, dumping filling, activating, and transferring that material, which will reduce the natural storage capacity land, interfere with natural drainage patterns, and water courses. That's Jeff's whole point. There's a water recharge system that prevents water. It, it's almost like we're getting a stormwater permit. The water will not be increased, which comes off the land. It doesn't create flowage of any kind. That's the reason it doesn't have a stormwater recharge system. Now, it's on the plan. It will be on the plan, and it will be part of the construction. That you have to go before town calm on the no i think i think i think it's not a well and so i think stormwater plan yes yeah, storm water planning right, right. <laughs> but your your point neil is that it, it just hasn't the, it, the way it's worded it says natural yeah storage capacity storage and, and capacity. it has not been as resolved. opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, modifying it right. in order to perhaps even improve its natural storage capacity right exactly a recharge plan and, and I I think you know a building on pilings um, you know with with impervious or pervious surface underneath it does that doesn't reduce the natural storage capacity once again I, I didn't write the bylaw but you know that it's it, it's in black and white what it says and I agree with the other parts of that section it doesn't apply but that first sentence I, I you know I, I guess we need to be convinced that whatever is being proposed is not going to do that well, I don't know what. And if you, I mean, I if you if talk about elevating the land two feet above your property, capacity of the land means mm -hmm. what is what is reduced the natural what is the natural storage capacity of what of the of, land of what store the capacity of the land to store what water water. water. And I think the, but, but you need to look at it as a whole, the whole neighborhood out to the ocean. And the other, I think, and from a stormwater context. It usually means storage capacity, which would affect your neighbors. And so, if you can, if you can confine through a water charge system, water on your property that would not have escaped before, and it still doesn't escape, you have done nothing 
to violate that section. It's if you, it's not reducing the storage capacity by causing more water to go on other people's land. Your position, Jeff, is that because of the zone that it's in, it's interpreted as being more than just the lot itself. That's correct. I, I actually have a question because um, it's not clear. Is the intent to raise the elevation of this land above the uh, adjoining properties? Uh, to raise the elevation of the land above the adjoining properties? There's a, uh, a two-foot retaining wall, Neil. Yeah. Right along the side, which is going to be a proposed fieldstone wall. And then this would be all at the same elevation. And then this this property over here is actually slightly higher. Yeah. Um, and there'd be a swale on either side that would swell to the back to this Caltech system, which is like a septic system. And all the roof water would go into that as well. So it actually takes water off the property yeah, and I, recharges I, it in. I, I guess if, if you're... I, I'm not. I, I don't want. I don't want to say. Okay, if you put a ten by ten pad, you reduce the natural storage capacity of the land, and you put in a dry well beside it. Um, it you can probably do things to offset. I just want to make sure the board's on board. You know, with whatever resolution they're coming up with on that one. Could, could I was aware of it. The slab would actually be under the house as well, Neil. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't take any water at all. Versus, like, as you say, like if it were a driveway that didn't have the house over it, now we're getting run off off that driveway. Right. This slab would be directly under the house, so it wouldn't you're uh, saying be impervious. You're saying the roof. The roof, the whole is house. taking the runoff. Correct. And, and the driveway, I'd be more than happy to put a stone driveway if that would help. Um, or seashell. You know, something other than asphalt, where asphalt water runs often can, can create issues. <clears throat> I'm going to end it uh, question or fact, not uh, opinion. Fact, opinion. Jamie Manklich, I'm a directed letter at number six Foam Road. A uh, couple issues. Um, the first one, the two foot contour drop. I, I live next to that lot. My property line is six feet off it. Um, it's, it's more than a two foot contour drop. I don't know who did the topo of that. I can guarantee you uh, it's probably more like a four-foot contour in the very deep middle of that land. Well, I, I'm not, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an engineered plan with, it's an engineered plan that's stamped by an engineer. I'm not going to, I mean, I, I'm not going to. It's right or wrong. Um, the, sec the second point is um, we have a sump pump, and the whole land basically drains towards that lot from that whole area on Jericho Road. Everything's draining towards that lot. That's the last portion of this area to drain. So when we finally walk out our doors, because it does flood, um, that's the last area where it's sump pumps and all the water runs down to that lot. So any raise and fill. You're just telling me that your sump pumps are pumping water onto his land? <laughs> <laughs> you sure you want to well, say that? It's on my land, and the water of the whole land brings it right down. Into <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could I just make a note also? It's not six feet. It's 14 feet to the proposed house, Jamie. I'm not just saying from saying your lot, lot line. No, from lot line. From my house to the lot line is six feet. Well, that's your encroachment. Well, it's not conforming. All right, all right. Uh, just one last point. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, my, I have a boat, uh, a 20-foot Rankin that's on a trailer that's about 10 feet off the property line. And during the last storm, my boat came off the trailer because there's about four to five feet of water um, in that area, and it floated off the trailer right next to the lot. How so long How long was it floating? Um, it, was, it was floating for a couple of three, three days, four days, before we could actually get over there. And if anyone on the board wants to come over during any storm that happens, you're welcome to come on my deck and watch the flooding that happens to this lot. Because it's, without a question, it does flood. Okay. All right, so, uh, so uh, anything further for you, Richard? No, thank you. All right, so let's take each one of the considerations, uh, A through F, and uh, we'll, um, we'll take a vote on each one of them. All right, so the first 
consideration is that the specific site is an appropriate location for the use or structure. And do it, each one of them as a yes. Individual move, vote. move to find that the move to find that. And we'll use that before each one. Right. Appropriate. Uh, the specific site is an appropriate location for the use or structure. Second. 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 All those in favor. Aye. 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 The uses developed will not adversely affect the neighborhood. So now, uh, <coughs> yeah, for, for both sides. I want to I want to say, with respect to that condition, that finding, um, it is always arguable that any development of an undeveloped lot will have an adverse effect on the neighborhood, particularly the next door neighbors who had open space next to them. Uh, I don't believe that a zoning bylaw takes the neighbor's view into effect, but when, when, when this bylaw specifies not adversely affect the neighborhood, it means the neighborhood as a whole, not the direct, necessarily the direct abutters. So, uh, all those in favor of finding that the uses developed will not adversely affect the neighborhood, say aye. 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 Uh, third one, there will not be an undue nuisance or serious hazard to vehicles or pedestrians as a result of the proposed use or structure. So moved? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor, aye. Vehicles or pedestrians? C. 950.3 C. 950.3 D. Adequate and appropriate facilities will be provided to assure the proper operation of the proposed use or structure. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. There will not be any significant impact on any public or private water supply. So, so moved. Town, second. Town sewer, town water, second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The site is not located within the Water Resources Protection District. Is that correct? All right. So uh, section F is inapplicable. So as a result of the finding of uh, items, uh, a, an affirmative finding of items A through E, uh, we are now at the stage, I suppose, of making a final motion to grant the special permit having made the required findings. I guess just to address one other question that we did talk about, the slab is under the house and there was a Talk about gravel outside that area. What about? The slab is under the house, and Neil had a concern about the slab outside the footprint of the house. Is that? No. No, I'll go fill for that you slab. Were, you were interested in, in whether or not gravel versus sand was used as a fill. The, um, no, I was suggesting some kind of gravel for a parking service. That, that was my original. Outside, yeah, outside the footprint of the house. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, I guess the question is, are you going to incorporate this into your special permit, or are they going to have to convince me that they've done this? You know I, mean? well, I think, I, I mean, I, yeah. I think the uh, <laughs> eliminating or reducing to the extent possible any impervious surfaces yeah. of, yeah. is a good idea. Mm -hmm. for, for clarification, Neil, if, if we, if the applicant were not to fill the land at all, right, they could still construct a house there on pilings, right, um, yes, and meet all requirements, yes. And the concern for the applicant, as best I can read it, is that they're looking to have something above 10 foot, so that a vehicle can park above 10 foot. So, but you could grade at existing grade and park under the house anyway. Yeah, very often it, they'll put 
what really should be conservation restrictions into zoning. Uh, I think for, to make it, I, I'm going to say, you know, it's uh, typically more black and white. It, it, it's, you know, it's usually not negotiable. Uh, but in this case here, um, I think it's broad enough, um, you know, verbiage that, that, you know, you're looking at the land, the whole land, and uh, what is the storage capacity currently, and what will be the storage capacity when they're finished. And that, that's really the answer. Is there a reason why there has to be a slab? For parking underneath. Well, I mean, if it was gravel underneath, it would still be. You could, you could still do that, but, you know, I, I think that the, the slab for parking reasons is much more stable. Could we, I'm recalling a discussion that was had before us some time ago about um, bricks or paving material brick that was basically a Pervious, pervious surface, surface. Um, semi pervious so that grass could grow up through parts of it and parts of it could be um, it, it was very stable you could drive on it but you could right. basically no, grow the grass through it all brick with patterns and that it. kind of thing Something like that would be okay as well I think it just I, I just figured that the slab being directly into the house wouldn't have any impact on but the other thing is the slab directly into the house you're gonna to have to make it either pretty thick um, you're gonna to have to make it pretty <laughs> substantial absolutely um, or you're going to have to put a frost wall on it, you know, sure. to some degree. So I think that the point of filling and ma maintaining the ability of that occasional weather-related standing water to to recharge the land, um, maybe it would be better to stay with something that's semi-permeable mm -hmm. um, and yet try to meet the parking concerns. So is that, does that... Is that something that could be evaluated with well, the building? We would, we can no, I mean, it, semi yeah, I think it all I, 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 yeah, I think it would it'd be preferable to have it put in a condition. Whether um, how how we go about doing that with the engineer wants to chime in on that and maybe prepare something. You know that that the it would be done in accordance with this. And because uh, they are, they are going to have to go for a stormwater permit and. <laughs> Essentially, in the stormwater permit, I think the the idea is that you, you recharge everything on site. So they may they may the exception of three feet of ocean water. Well, well, why don't we just have a condition that says that the that the uh, whatever the surface that's underneath the dwelling um, um, is um, remains is designed to to minimize to the extent maximum extent possible the uh, or to maximize the amount of. Uh, yeah, recharge on site. Recharge. Like that. Well, at the same time, being so a strong enough surface to park on, yes. it's, 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 that, that the parking surface shall be created in such a way as to uh, maintain the rechargeability of the soil to the maximum that degree possible. We can deal with with the storm water versus. Well, that's I'm trying to. What I'm suggesting is the language state what the boards. Uh, in, intent was and leave it to leave it to others that are more uh, attuned to the specifics to so that they know what our purpose was. Yeah, yeah. not but but not an actual condition. No. Well, no, no, no. no, no. We'll, we'll put it as a condition. Okay. Yeah. Something to the effect of that the parking area as proposed under the structure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at that point, maybe even just in a large um, uh, grab inch and a half stone. But again, that can be decided by the stormwater. I think yeah. your language was perfect, actually, what you yeah. said initially. Parking surface what? shall be maximize. designed to maximize the, the ability to recharge so soil, uh, water, sir, water on, on the site. site. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, so with that, can, any other condition? Uh, impervious driveway or, or landscaping semi-pervious like, like the pavers because the portions are impervious in between they have the portions that is there really a difference between impervious and semi-pervious I think con it comes up a lot in conservation they consider bituminous concrete or as or concrete impervious but if you do the pavers that have the holes in between them, them a lot They're not really rooms. completely pervious. They call them semi-pervious. 
Okay. Semi-pervious or pervious? <coughs> Landscaping? Swales as shown on plan. We don't have any contours on the plan, but that's, again, that's stormwater is going to take care of that, presumably. All right. All right. Uh, motion to approve the special permit with the conditions discussed. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Three nothing. Uh, whose decision is this to write? I hope it's yours. Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah's? <laughs> I just said it. Uh, Sarah and Frank. Actually, Peter, no, that was it. And oh, boy. John, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I just, you know, I, I know that there's some people that are unhappy in this room. And, um, you know, if we went the other way, there would be people that, there are other people that would be unhappy in this room. But I do, I do encourage you all, you know, to think about what you would want and how you would be thinking if this was your property. All right? So that you'll understand, you know, that this is not a black and white situation. It is not a black and white situation. You may, you know, you live next door, you think it's black and white. It's not. It never is. <coughs> Can I just ask the one last question? Yes, you may. Do we have a sewer moratorium on new construction, or am I imagining that? It's well, been off for some time. It's up? It's on? <coughs> yeah. There is no more tour. All right. Not at now, this, point. Uh, this had, decision. We had one until they, uh, I think, uh, established the uh, sewer fees, which I think they've done. Is that yes. correct? But yeah, I think that pretty sure. The selectmen had a temporary moratorium. Ed, what's your timing on decision writing these days? Get to it. You don't have a, you don't have a proposed one. In um, uh, yeah. I, 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 I have it helping any way I can. I, I just want to make. Sure. You're going on trial. You're going on yeah, trial. Yeah, but I can, but I, yeah, I was just so nervous about that. It starts, it doesn't start to a week, but I can do it after that. I can do it like the first week. Well, I mean, it's up to you. First week yeah. in November? I can get it. I can get out. I mean, I, you know, there's a, there's an extensive, lengthy period of time afterwards when the decision is filed with the clerk, all right, um, there is a 20-day appeal period thereafter once the decision is filed with the clerk, so, um, and then once that 20 days, you're, We'll see what happens. Jeff, do you have a card? Yeah, I know. All right. Yeah. I, I appreciate, I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate your approach because I've been doing this for 43 years, and I've, I've seen in other communities just the opposite direction where there's the total lack of concern for people's pro private property rights. And it's admirable that you are sensitive to your bylaw and sensitive to people's private rights because often people forget there are always two sides to this. And it's never easy for someone when their neighborhood changes, but it's also never easy for someone to be deprived of something that's valuable to them. And I've seen it happen. This case I'm going forward is an absolute tragedy. And I've won the wealth that has been going on for 12 years where through both planning board and a buddy neighbors it's, it's a travesty and someone's lost an eight hundred thousand dollar lot it's, it's just not right but again, i again appreciate your sensitivities to 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 all issues it's important and really nice to see did you put these in the record or are these um, for the record these? yeah they're there because they support all the allegations but you didn't give them to i her. did I, you did okay. yeah, copy all right well uh you, you know I, this is not an easy job no, this not. is my last term I would like to also say thank you. I know it was, you know, up here and thought out. Very long and thought out. Well, you're welcome. We appreciate it. And, um, and, and get out of here because there's a number of people have been waiting for two hours. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it, Tell. Really. I know Townsend. <laughs> I know Townsend. I just want my pictures. Sit there and make decisions. I know Townsend. Thank you very much. You're, you're Townsend, right? That's where you're from, yeah. Well, that's the
the um, how long have you been in Townsend? Like forever? Uh, my wife's family's been Is that right? <laughs> One of my oldest and best friends down on the Cape, he grew up in Townsend. His, his father was a farmer. His father buy a, buy an old farm, fix it up, sell it, buy it, move to the next farm, fix it up, sell it. His name was Florence. No? All right. Of course you won. <laughs> yeah, really. No, I really did. All right. I really did. We need to move on. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, 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 you do. You. All right, next. Let's move along. change of address. Uh, yes, it's 143A. 143A? A, yes. Okay. Uh, is the is the discrepancy of the address, does the discrepancy of the address pose a notice issue? Um, I think we're trying, going to call it a Scribner's error. It doesn't change the, uh, the butters, it, it, all of the butters, the same yeah. butters. Same of butters? Yeah. Okay. Um, what happened was the assessor's card, the assessor's map showed it 145R. Yeah. But if you read the deed for the property next door, yeah. their deed says 145R. Okay. So it was easier to change the assessor's map. Than All right. Uh, are there abutters to this property here today? No? Okay. All right. Are you by yourself? I am. <laughs> Proceed. Okay, for the record, my name is uh, Jeff Asset. I'm a professional engineer with Morse Engineer. And, um, I'm here today representing the owner of the property and the applicant, Mr. William Murphy. Um, the applicant has filed a finding under General Laws Chapter 48, Section 6, to allow a reconstruction and extension of an existing non-conforming single-family dwelling. Uh, the property is located off of Glades Road, number 145A. Uh, it's shown as parcel 5-3-76. It's located in the R3 zone. Um, it's a little more than 2,700 square feet in land, all up in and it's currently approved with an existing single family dwelling um, here and at that. Um, there's an existing right of way across the front portion of the property and the remaining portions of the property um, here and here are currently existing ground and driveway. Um, so this property is non conforming um, currently because uh, it, doesn't, it does not meet the requirements of lot area, frontage, width, or front and side setbacks. Um, this filing will not increase the non-conformity of it. What we are proposing to do is tear down the existing uh, dwelling that hasn't been maintained in tough shape um, and reconstruct a new single-family dwelling in generally the same location. Um, the, the, the proposed footprint complies um, with the rear yard setback and it, it, is, it, is, it is not any greater than the existing setback on the sides and the front. Uh, the new structure will not will not affect the access around the property. Um, it does not encroach into the, the gravel driveway or the right. And um, again, this this property, like the last, is located within the FEMA flood zone. Um, it is a reconstruction project. Um, the uh, flood the flood elevation here is elevation 10, and we will be constructing the first floor of this property uh, well above that elevation. Uh, elevation 11 or higher. Um, this property will be it will be supported by concrete pilings, um, and it will require a uh, sub a uh, septic system, uh, which will be located. The tanks will be under the gravel driveway, and there's room along the sides or even under the structure um, for the leaching field. It will be serviced by water in the front of the house. There's an existing water main running down the right way, and this project will require. Um, also approval by the Board of Health for a septic system design plan. 
and by the Conservation Commission for a stormwater permit and notice of intent. Um, it's my opinion that this is the appropriate location for a dwelling. It's already a dwelling here and it's worked for years. Um, it's also zoned for residents. The, um, the dwelling will not adversely impact the neighborhood. There's already a dwelling here and we're really only improving the situation. We're constructing a new, new dwelling up higher above the flood zone. We're not bringing in any fill on this property, property at all. And it'll be constructed on miles. Um, it will not cause a hazard to pedestrians or vehicles for maintaining the same access around the building. <coughs> and it will not affect the public or private water supply. There are no wells um, in the neighborhood. Uh, it's serviced by town water, and it's not located within the Water Resource Protection District or a DEP. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. What's the elevation? What elevation is elevation 10? For female, female elevation. Yeah. I have a map here. I'll look at it. How many years have I been on this board? Seven? And we have two floodplain special permits in the city. back to back. Are there any neighbors here that are going to say that this land floods? I live on this one for seven years. <laughs> and I've never seen it. Do you really live in the neighborhood? Here, this is, this is a floodplain special permit that doesn't require a finding that it's not subject to flooding. Why? Because it's a ten feet. No, it's because it's, it's uh, an existing. Oh, it's floor. a replacement. That's right. Yes, of course. Good. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a little gunshot. You live in the neighborhood? You live in the neighborhood? Did you say? I've been renting these number one twenty ones down this way um, for about two years. Rent. Yes. For two years. Yes. We love the house. We've been shopping for two years, so. <laughs> so probably kind of is one of that neighborhood where you can afford to rent, but you can't afford to buy. You got it. All right. Any questions? I, I just have a question. Did, yes. did, you're not showing extension of the house. This is a deck here, correct? On that one foot, foot, one point four deck. Um, no, that's not a great copy because it's not a great scale. Let me. Uh, this yeah. A little more over there. yeah. Here's my. Um, Oh, you're, so you're basically you're going back towards the back property line another ten feet. Okay, so you are yes, going and it, way it back. It fully yeah. complies with the rear yard side. Right. Okay. Here's the here's here's the deal that here's the deal that uh, that we we uh, how we treat these we have uh, in the past, particularly with the small lots. So we have these small lots where we have a house that's that's you know gravely um, uh, non-compliant with the side yard particularly side yard setbacks particularly when there are dwellings of on the on the um, abutting lots and 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 the way that we kind of look at these is well you know we'll you, you want to expand the size of your house and get more dwelling here um, and and you're showing us well you're not increasing the non-conformities but you've got a piece of property here which is 1.4 feet from a property line and you've got 12.2 feet on the other side which you're maintaining so that you can continue to have your existing gravel driveway. When you could take that same house and move it over four feet and give your neighbor to the west, uh, to the west another four feet of, of uh, you know, setback and put the house in the middle of the lot. There's, um this is the access to the back. Um, yeah, it's a driveway. It's a, it's a driveway. There's only 12 feet to the property line. It looks like only another two feet to that house. We're only talking only 14 feet between the houses. I wouldn't feel comfortable putting putting in the middle. So don't have a driveway. You have to park somewhere. I can park on the or front line. Driveway. I got uh, I got 11 feet in the front. That's a uh, right I'm just th way. I'm throwing it out there. Yeah, that, that's a right of way out front. And that's oh, yeah. Nice oh, okay. Well, line. here we go. Defending your position. Good. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so what you're saying is that as much as you'd like to, there's no practical way for you to improve the non-conforming setback on that side. Again, one of the things we, we consider is the neighbor next door. Although currently they have approximately a 12-foot setback, they have a right to be within eight feet, so they could move it closer. But 
in doing so, the proximity of your new structure is going to limit their ability to utilize their lot as well. So, yeah, and you're also you're going up, right? It, all right, so so you take that well. We haven't changed the setback, but what you're really doing is you're you're doubling the mass of the of the wall that your neighbor is looking at, right? Um, is this neighbor um, a seasonal resident? Are these seasonal residents down here? Is there a reason why there aren't any neighbors here? That I'm not sure of. I don't know who's um, personally. I, we designed the new septic for either them or the previous owner a few years back. Yeah? A couple years back. Well, you live in the neighborhood. You got any neighbors this time of year? I'm over here. It's about 50% seasonal. Yeah. Um, I don't drive down this road in the winter. Yeah. Nobody does. <laughs> Unless you live there. Is that the road that goes out <coughs> to the island? No. No, that's no. further down. That down further? This really just goes back to these two houses. This was my oh, I know where it is. My yeah. college roommates. It's across uh, from the seawall, right? Wife family yes. owned that house. Right. It's almost like it it's not really a road. No. Yeah. <coughs> you don't know that it's a road there. It's no, just a gravel. It's gravel. It's just gravel that has tire tracks in it. Right. All right. Uh, any questions, John? You got anything for this? I John? think part of the uh, just the one point four is, is is a little tight. You probably have to ask some neighbors' permission to work on your house because <laughs> you can't. <laughs> no place to go. Uh, uh, and it, then you, I, you're going to run into a man, building. Right code away, it's got to be kept that way for the fire department and everything else. So it's, it's yeah. You know, I, and it's you can't squish that down because then they can't. Twenty-four get foot wide house, and they're just going to have to do some serious fire protection on that side. Yeah. Like building a house in the city. Yeah. Uh, no, other than that, huh? uh, no questions. Well, at least you're not doubling the size of it. Isn't somebody? I should. Somebody has just gotten nervous because that's coming up next. Okay, um, Frank. Any questions from you, nope. Ed? No. Nope. Well, I'm glad. <coughs> I'm glad to know that you're restore, re replacing a dwelling and not building a new one. Makes it a little easier. Um, all right. Who's got a motion? He's got a big calculator. Lots of buttons. I'll move to. Um, this is a special permit, right? Section section six. It is a oh, it's section a, six. So this is a just a finding. No, it's a four seventy point nine two. We need to. We need. Oh, we don't need to make that. We don't. Yeah, it's but two. you said. Yeah, it's. It, it's the uh, under it's a, a section uh, six finding special permit yeah in a 470.9 floodplain special permit because we're expanding it's a substantial improvement in the floodplain okay. okay all right so we do need to make the finding that it's not in fact subject to flooding no, <laughs> no because it's reconstruction right, right. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to do that <laughs> I really don't so under 470, do you want to do a 470.9 individually again, or? Yeah, uh, no, we're doing 470.6F. So we need to make the findings that the improvements are consistent yeah. with the requirements of the flood insurance program, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Move to find that they are consistent, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think we need to. That article and You're writing this one, so oh, yeah, you're writing this one. Oh, I am. That's what she said. You're next, so I get the next one. All right. Well, do I, mean, I just want to trade with me. Are your improvements consistent with the National Flood Insurance Program? Yes, they are. Are you building this in accordance with the flood-resistant construction standards? Yes, I am. And is there anything in your improvements that will affect the natural drainage patterns of the water course? No. Sounds like matrimony here. <laughs> <laughs> I do. There is no water course. All right. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> what's the motion? The motion is Ed. The motion is to motion uh, is to find that the um, the applicants of the requirements of 40, say, 40, 470. No, well, I'll do 470. Six F first have been met, right? And that we can grant a finding slash special permit under Chapter Forty A, Section Six, to allow um, raise and reconstruction of the non-conforming structure, and that it will be not 
not be um, can we, significantly, uh, substantially, substantially detrimental, detrimental to the neighborhood. Can we give the right address, though, just to get the correction out? Because the plans label one address and the, actually and the submitted. I submitted a revised plan this afternoon to just to clarify it. Okay. So, a revision date of today. All right. And so, I had the correct address. So it should be 145A, correct. Glades Road. And if you could reference to the plan revised today. Okay. All right. Motion's made. You second? Second. All right. Was that 143 or 145A? 145A. 145A. Okay. Uh, so that, is that revision seconded. three? Yeah. Made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. You want me to write the decision or you want to write it? I'll, I'll write it. Write it. Yeah. Welcome. Now you have to drive by the house. <laughs> if you drive by that house, you're lost. <laughs> really? Briefly, huh? <laughs> the one to the left? Yeah. The one to the north? South. All right, next. Not to not to rush you along, but <laughs> infinite that's right you did yeah. so you, did you said impudent or something or? I don't know yeah. <laughs> I hope it wasn't it Is this the Paul Mirabito show? Sometimes. All right. Kind this is Gilson Road. Oh, That's yeah, yeah. Okay. This is the big one that we Where's just the tore down and they built. Um, right in here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, of course, there. it's down here. Yeah. Right. Whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my name is Paul Margito from Ross Engineering Company. I'm representing the owner and the applicant. I'm um, the lease for yourself. Uh, the applicant owns an existing dwelling on the corner of uh, Moreland Road and the Driftway. The existing house on the plan is shown in brown. There's also a uh, detached garage within a third of the parking line to the uh, east side of the existing single family dwelling. Um, it's proposed to raise the existing dwelling and reconstruct it in a location that would be less non conforming with respect to the primary setback on the driftway and uh, Moreland Road. The existing setback is 13 feet to the front entryway. The proposed would be 13.1 uh, from the driftway on Moreland Road. It would be increased from 22.2 to 22. It's also proposed to have a, a wing off of the house. The uh, solid blue is the proposed dwelling. The dash blue is the proposed open deck off the back of the house. The solid wood is a small wing that would uh, connect the new dwelling to the uh, one car garage. Um, no, 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 the no. land is relatively flat. We do show elevations here. There's less than a foot of uh, uh, change in the elevation. There's no proposed changes in the grade. 
It will still be serviced by uh, town sewer and water. Um, and we're also asking for an increase in the gross uh, gross floor area of 186%. Um, percent. There's a picture in the um, application that shows there's been a, it shows the current condition of the house, which is a one story house. The proposed house will have the second story of the studio on the uh, top um, of the building. It'll be um, well below the 40 foot height allowance. That's measured to the peak of the roof from the existing grade. Again, we're asking for a special permit slash fine for this. In accordance with section 810, I believe, of the bylaw, and or section 40A, section 6 as well. So, with that, I'll end my presentation and answer any questions the members of the board may have. Go ahead, Ed. I have a big concern with attaching it to the existing garage. Yeah, um, if you attach it to the existing garage, that may be purely the intent of the applicant to um, simply be able to go from the garage into the structure. However, once it's attached, the garage then gets treatment under 48, 48 Section 6, and it's only inches from the sideline. The existing garage is detached at the moment and has no protection. So wouldn't it be prudent um, to just take it out? Take the garage out? And incorporate? Or, or take out the swing? <clears throat> Paul, your practice, meticulous practice in almost every case, when you come in here with uh, proposals where there are nonconformities with setback, is to provide us proof that each one of the nonconformities has been reduced. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and this is a new one. What's the condition of the garage now? I mean, are we talking about, I mean, is it? What's the condition of it? Yeah, what's, what's its condition? I mean, well, a lot of these garages, when they're sitting right on the property line, they, you know, I mean, some of them are, you can push them over. And, and you know, the idea of converting, you know, a, a, what is, you know, essentially a structure that's, for all intents and purposes, it's grandfathered, but it's going away at some point. And now we're sort of breathing life uh, into, you know, this new structure that will, you know, perpetuate <coughs> this, this nonconformity, um, you know, forever. An extreme nonconformity. Uh, an extreme nonconformity. Oh. The uh, garage is going to remain a single garage. If there's no, um, there's no addition vertically to it. This is a single story addition here, simply to get from the main body of the house out to the garage. If, if this was not constructed, she could leave this here as a matter of right. That's my understanding. If she were to connect it, the garage still stays there. Nothing changes. If you notice, the uh, furniture is 98.13 feet. Her deed costs for 100 feet. Back in 1988 or 89, we surveyed this block from Moreland Road down to Collier Ave. When they built it and when they monumented the driftway, all the frontages did not add up. So we had to apportion the frontages between the parcel over here that we surveyed. The net effect was that they, in effect, lost 1.87 feet. If that was 100 feet, the garage would be about uh, three feet off the ground. <coughs> But the reason we see it being that close is because of the because um, the portion of the furniture that we had to um, take into account when we surveyed these three properties back in 1989. But um, I guess what I don't understand is um, if the garage is there now, it's going to stay a single car garage, and she's simply attaching it to the house. We're not changing the setback to that structure. But that structure but I think then becomes part of the house and becomes protected under 40A, Section 6. Mm -hmm. In the future, a future applicant could decide to make that a two-story addition. But with the finding, I think one of the things you have to look at is, will this proposed work make this any more detrimental to the neighborhood? Clearly, Potentially, yes. Clearly it wouldn't because it's there now. But clearly it could because in the future it could be utilized as a, as a structure. Well, we do have to deal with the application that's uh, in unless front of you, us. Unless you had a condition for 
Well, it still, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't foreclose a future property owner from coming in to ask for it, whether it's in the decision or not. You know what? I, I, in my, our interest, my interest is in knowing how a creative guy like you can take this proposal uh, and do something to ameliorate that not that particular point seven foot non uh, uh, non conforming setback you've got twenty two point eight feet um, on the opposite side <coughs> on <Maryland, coughs> right yes no, uh, this because right. it's two front two front yards right that's the challenge right <coughs> The board's, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we were to reduce the non-conformity of that structure in the garage? I think, the, so I think it should come down, to be honest. Pardon? I think it should be come down and be incorporated into the new structure. You say it should be come down and, and we meet the side yard setback? And be incorporated into the new structure. What is the uh, what's the what is the proposed use of that that single story extension that meets the garage? Is that kitchen? Well, this yeah. this in here. Yeah. It's um. There's a bathroom in there. Uh, let's see. It's only to pack the garage for access. It's, it's a, a laundry. The bathroom in the way. And there's a laundry and a, a mud room, and then a set of stairs going down to the first floor, going down into the garage. I would like to, uh, now, since, your, since your client is... One of the things we could do, I mean, the house had to be redesigned with the rear yard setbacks, only 20 feet. We've got 9.7 feet to play with. I guess you could bump this out and push that over. I don't want to go on the Moreland side because there's a fabulous tree there. I don't want to oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, your neighbors would be more upset about the tree going than in your garage. I <laughs> oh, okay, good. Well, um, so so, you heard, you heard what our concerns are here. Um, we're we're trying to deal with this 0. 0.7 foot setback on the garage, and we're looking for ways that may, that might make this a little bit more sensitive to what we're trying to do here. Do you uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I want a garage. Well, I mean, somebody could suggest that you knock down the garage and put it where the single-story extension that gets you to the garage is. I that just did that. One. Then I lose, <laughs> but then I lose um, the laundry room and the bathroom. And, well, you could incorporate that into the garage or even the second have, floor on the garage. The, the house would be deeper. You know, was a back of the house would go out further, another eight feet. But then you it got, really is up against the other property. Pardon? Then it's up against the other property. Well, not by 0. 0.7 feet, no. Let me show you. Can I just show you the plans? Yes. Yeah. What you're suggesting, at least, is that is the eight feet the minimum that you accept? Would you go less than that? Well, we've we, we've let you go from 0. 0.7 to 0. 0.9 or something. You know, I mean, I, I you know, the the most you can, you know, we're we're looking for some some change. We're not saying you must go to eight feet because okay. that would. You know. What they're saying is if we can push this in and maybe build something in here to make it a little easier. I know, this is a, this is a very good size so line. We could build anything and stay within the setback on that side. This area here was a deck. Yeah, I and they're, we're declaring this a side line. And it's stuck with this being a rear line. Big right? lot. It's only 7,400 square feet. That's plenty big. Maybe it, even, it, even if it's five feet, you know, you get some working room more. Okay. Seven, seven inches. <laughs> and someone in the future will call it part of the house. Oh, yeah, because you see, it says it right in the application that it, it's going, you know, existing setbacks are going from 32.7 to. So you're at three seven. feet. She'd be willing to pull this over, I mean, take the garage and pull it over another three feet from what it is, so it'd be about a three and a half or four foot setback up the side of the line. Anyone else have any questions? I want to hear from the from the folks in the neighborhood that are here too. 
Uh, why don't we hear from them now? So, who is, who's here to be heard for or against this? Uh, um, good evening. My name is Charlie Bragg. I'm with Jason Schooley. I'm sorry, uh, Charlie? Bragg. Uh, we lived in the neighborhood now for about four years. Mm -hmm. Are you on the garage side? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And um, the concern with the garage is this, at least alluded to it, it is 50 years old. We recently done like, long, a lot of landscaping along the edge of our, our property line. Mm -hmm. uh, we have trees, hedges planted. And on our side, there, I think one of the things that we did notice is that the garage has fallen down. There's a lot of rust. Just needs to be updated and things like that. Um, ideally, since she is tearing the house down, you know, building a house with a garage attached to it, yep. you know, as part of the main house, just seems like the ideal solution or everything, rather than trying to fix up this house, this garage, which is great on our property and the type of like Okay. Um, and plus, we just had our property survey too, and um, our intent is also to expand to the future, going back and going up. So we're just trying to get. You know, What's your setback? Uh, eight feet. Yours is eight. Um, eight feet on the side. On the side. side. Okay, so you're compliant. We're compliant. Okay. Well, the two driveways abut each other with, with for the trees, the uh, bushes between them. Okay. So well, your driveway would be a garage. What's the setback on your garage? Let's say eight, eight uh, feet. To the front or to the side? To the side. On the side is, it, um, we just had a survey, it was like, I think at eight feet on the side, and it's like 20 feet from the front. Okay. <coughs> right. And we can bring the survey maps on the I think they show it. Yeah, the little corner of it. That's the garage, not the structure. That's not the house. That's the garage. That's the garage, right? I, I'd like to see it be six feet. I mean, I don't want to quibble over a couple of feet, but I, I really do think in a new construction um, that the existing garage on the, on the property line should disappear. It should be incorporated into the new design. And that setback should be, a strong attempt should be met to maintain the setback. <coughs> as, as your application says, you're, you're going from a 33-foot setback to a 32, .7? Yeah, 32.7 to 7, point, oh, point 0.7. You're, you're, you're adding 30 feet of house to it, is the way it, your application reads, into, an, uh, into the setback. Oh, you mean from 32.7 to the existing house? Yeah. Right. Where, where we're going to connect? You're going to go yeah. all the way to 0. 0.7. That's 30 and feet of house. Would accept if we, if we pull this over, um, if we were to hold the 22.2 um, and take that six tenths of a foot, we could, um, we could pull this over four feet from where it is now. Or just take the edge of the garage and pull it over four feet. So you got them from three to four, just by okay. mentioning the number six. I'll mention eight then. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, why don't we just go to the eight? Why don't we just maintain the eight foot size nine setback? The Tear the garage down. If you look at the first floor plan, what, uh, what he has it's a new house. Have... You can make it anything you want. Pardon? It's a new house. You can make it anything you want. Well, you can even make it two. You can even make the garage right. component two stories. What I'm trying to do is you put the laundry the whole... upstairs with the bedrooms where it belongs, oh, and you can. Problems. I'm sorry. Then, then make a first floor master suite, and uh, that's what I have. Okay. I'm I'm not designing your house. I'm no, I'm trying to say that the lot doesn't uh, zoning doesn't suggest that you should be putting your house within four within seven tenths of the. No, I am not. Look, I understand. With all due respect, I've seen so many houses in that neighborhood that are like within a foot. And if they come in here wanting to do this, we'll do the same thing to them. That's what they just did. I mean, Where? Collier, no. right around the corner in Collier. What's that? Do you know what you're talking about? Oh. Okay. 
with our practice to reduce nonconformities when, we, where, where, and when we can, particularly for uh, for raise and reconstruct. I think we're within two feet here. Yeah. He says yeah, four. So do we want to? <laughs> the five feet will also make it. You know, the fire code will be more than five feet. Well, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> the other point. Right. You're going to save yourself well, a few dollars how about, here. How about we settle on five? It's to your advantage because the. If you're within five feet of the sideline, you have to build um, at fire code ratings that make your structure. The walls expensive. and windows are much more expensive to build. Oh, yeah, even if it's <coughs> Think about it. Garages where the f most flammable thing you own is, like your lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> your car's never in it. There's no right. room. <laughs> no room for that. Can you work with five, Paul? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to? Do you want us to approve the permit and provide that you submit a revised plan consistent with our condition that the new structure shall not be um, shall be a minimum of. Five feet for the property line. Usually, property and then, line. And then, or do you want to? Do you want to get a new plan approved by us? Can you spend a second on the client? Sure. It's just a matter of another month. I mean, he's going to have to do the plan anyway. So. Peter, we'll, um, we'll, we'll go with the five feet and we submit a revised plan. Okay. Um, the revised plan, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to hold the existing setback on Moreland Road. Yep. So the 22.2. 22.2, we'd hold that. Yep. All right. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, with that, um, who's got a motion? Edward. We don't need a power okay. test, right? You're the designated motion. We don't need a power test, right? No. no. So move to approve the uh, 48 Section 6 binding slash special permit to raise and reconstruct the uh, property at 19 Driftway um, with the condition that the sideline setback to the east be maintained no closer than five feet and the allowance of the sideline setback to the west be maintained no closer than 22.2. Front and rear setbacks from the driftway to be as shown on the plan. Pardon me? Just lift it no, it's it shown on the plan. Well, I'd, I'd say the uh, as long as they're as long as the setback on the line conforms. Setback conforms. How much? How much? Uh, how much room do you have? In the rear yard. Yeah. <clears throat> Money. The rear yard setback from. It's twenty feet. It's uh, twenty, 20 feet. feet. You've got nine feet. And the proposed house is twenty-six and a half. Yeah. So you got six feet. You got six and a half feet to work with. As long as you're with it, you can. <clears throat> right. I can still move the back of the house. Right. Of up writing. to 20. And if we do that, then I'll, I'll show but that. Well, the, uh, excuse me. The way we um, the way we do it under the new bylaw is the side yard. Perfect. Talking about here? No. Yeah. Four on the lot. It has that one rear line. Come up, come up, you eight, your uh, three, 20 feet, swing it out. 20 feet, right. There's your side. 
put the sides? Right here. Yeah, we're the same. The same whole structure. Feet. Feet. Five so you're just a right. Or even this way. Okay. Up to the 20 foot radius. Right. Okay. Should we All right. pull that back would be fine. Yeah. We'll yeah. pull a lot if you have to. That's the new bottle I wrote, right? Right. Yeah, the curve on the okay. side here. May I just ask one question? Yes. If, if it were not connected. It's not connected, she could leave the garage where it is. By right. She could, she just couldn't rebuild it. Pardon? She couldn't rebuild it. She couldn't raise and rebuild it? In the same footprint? If it's if it's a standalone, if it's detached? If it's if it's you can maintain it, if it's condemned, if it burns down by natural situation, if termites eat it, um, then you could rebuild the, it. The way I handle it, if if it is falling down, I have to condemn it. And most building inspectors do it this way. You could build in the exact same footprint, the exact height, no changes in dimension, shape. There's no case law on it, but it's typically what building inspectors let you do. And that, that wall would probably have to be concrete block, the one that's seven inches from the sideline. Usually they'll move them. The She'd still have to come here. Huh? No, not um, accessory dwelling. Accessory car. Uh, it's not a single family right. dwelling, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's just, uh, yeah. It's, it's just an accessory structure. It's a detached accessory structure pre existing zone. It's detached accessory structure, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's just the way building inspectors do it, but I'm not saying that would stand up in court. That's just that's one of those things, you know. <laughs> Can I tear down my dilapidated garage and put it back? Yeah, in the exact same footprint, same height. Don't change anything. And, and you may disagree, with it, but that's the way I do it. I'm not a big fan of perpetuating nonconformity. Right. The reason why they're grandfathered is because grandfathers die. I, I will tell you what happened. Ninety percent of people want to expand them. They don't want to do them in the same footprint. So they, they expand them and then put right. them. for the new castle. If they're gonna build a new garage, they don't want an old, you know, twelve foot wide, ten foot wide, you know, that was built sixty years ago. All right, so circling back, are we back to where we were? Five feet, and you can work with, you can stay within the setbacks for the rear and front. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, in the Moreland Road. And stay, and, and stay with what you propose in Moreland Road. Right? Okay. Did you make that motion? I made that motion. Do we need to reference, um, 810? 810, yes. Yes. Well, will you be changing the 22.2? You won't be changing the 22.2? No. Okay. You made the motion. Um, Did you second it? Yes. Okay. Oh, 810.2 is the, is the increase in the gross floor area. Right. 186%. Right. Uh, not more than 186%. <clears throat> You should be doing it less now because you're going to be moving the garage over. You want to come to us with a plan? <laughs> well, right. I mean, if you want, we're going back to. Are you are you are you proposing to do something different now? I'm I'm now I'm confused. To We're going to do the attach. You want to attach the garage? We make you move it five feet back, and you can redesign whatever you want to do. All right. Are you suggesting something else now? No, no, no. But you had said, excuse me for not understanding. You had said that. So all, I'm sure it's my fault. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that if I went, I had plenty of room to go back further. But if I go back, oh, I won't be. That's right. It won't be because the 186. What I lose on the side goes right. to the back side. Right. Yeah. Well, and. And technically, okay, I think the 186. Wrong. We don't want to make a mistake here. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay. The 186 was also factoring in that whole addition of getting all the way over to the that's previously existing realized. garage. So that's going to be yeah. gone. That's what I was just realizing. Okay. Just well, uh, but but 
But this is the other thing. If you're, if you're going to go with this revision and you're, you've got, now got the opportunity potentially, if you want to, to Put go up, um, then yeah, that, that will affect what the percentage is that we put into the decision. I appreciate you wanting to move this forward, but the hearing is basically done. All we're doing is asking for the revised plan to vote on, and that would allow us to be, to clarify that 186 under 810. It might be particularly if you want the extra living space upstairs. If you if you decide that you don't, then we're okay. But you'd have to come back and ask to us put, to revise it. Yeah. I don't think we want to. I don't think we want to say go ahead and just put the five feet in without knowing what the you know the, the you know whether it's 186 or 220 or whatever it is. But if um, I'm trying to keep it down, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I'm I can with 800 and something square feet. So right. I want you to think it's like something. No, 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 no. It's, it's, no. They always look bigger on the plan than when you go out there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Really, they do. You know, you go so. What? Did, how did they get that house on this lot? Um, so. When's our next hearing? November. I mean, you know, for for all practical purposes. It's it's going to take you a month to get a revised plan anyway, right? What I was going to say was, they won't have a, a written decision in 30 days. If we want to put it off for a month, we could look at the plan. If we want to change something, come back and I could prepare a decision. Yes. For you that night. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you, you bring a decision that night. We'll sign it that night. You can. We'll record it the next day, and, and then you just you got lost 20 any days. time. And then you don't, you don't. You don't. You're actually gaining time. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's good. So we move to continue the hearing. Yes. To allow the applicant. Time to prepare a revised plan yes. and proposed decision. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good. Say, hey, John, that means you don't have to write hey, a decision. You get the next one. No, I'm not. Uh, well, going to be written. <laughs> no, you can go. He's, he's got more work to do. <coughs> You caught me. I'm going to do it. I got to remember. Is there anyone in the uh, audience that is here for this application? Oh, all right. Everybody. Okay. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the applicant is on the existing dwelling the land at uh, number 568 First Parish Grove. It's just over 14 acres in size. What she's proposing to do is on the easterly side of the property is to um, create a 50 foot lot <coughs> with the dwelling to the rear of the property. Um, the proposed lot would have 80,010 square feet. And this is the one. Uh, we have performed soil evaluation percolation tests on the site. Uh, it was successful. Uh, the uh, property would be serviced by Talon Water. It has its own septic system. Or it would be overhead power. And um, the remaining land is going to remain in the name of the applicant, which is uh, one of the new jobs. Uh, trustee. Show a note on the plan, note 8 saying that the deed for the proposed lot 1 is subject to a special permit issued by the Board of Appeals pursuant to section 6 10 2 d such a zoning by law that lot 1 shall not be further subdivided. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, the existing house will, will have all the requisite uh, dimensional requirements for single family homes. Zoning bylaw. So that'll end the presentation. Any questions you may have? My recollection that 
Mr. Arcan used to want that to be shall not be further divided. Is there a distinction without a difference? Yes. You want it to be what? He said Arcan divided. Arcan used to be very careful to say it shall not be further divided. And I, yeah. He had a big he had a big not deal about divided. it. The problem is the uh, that's the language in your zoning bylaw. I mean, Wally's absolutely correct. It's a division, not a subdivision, but your bylaw yeah. doesn't say that. Okay. So I'm just. Um, I, I don't remember. I never understood why, right. but I know he was very insistent. Oh, he, he's, he's, he's absolutely right, but, you, but whoever wrote the bylaw didn't put that language in there, but we have to follow that. If it, it wouldn't be a subdivision. Right. If you cut off 5,000 feet, it's all good. Well, there's, there's two meanings to sub, subdivide. One is the land use term, and the other one is a verb. Which means to divide again, or divide into smaller. You must beds. be an English major. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Six ten. Anybody <coughs> have any questions for Mr. Mirabito? This looks like kind of a layup. What's the um, What's the status of the rest of the? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. He wants an I-588 for his parish. Okay. Uh, I, I've known Paul a long time. Does this open up a doorway to subdivide or uh, back? Yeah, I was going to ask that very No, what you, what you want to do is to try to carve one lot off mm -hmm. in the short term. Um, the short term? The short term. I mean, once, once this is approved, mm -hmm. uh, if someone buys that lot, then that's going to be taken out of the remaining property. The, you know the remaining property. It's a two-acre lot, so she's taking two acres out of 14, setting that side for a single-family house. She still has her existing house there. Um, could she subdivide it? She could, but that was tried a few years ago, as you know, and it didn't go anywhere for a whole number of reasons. There's a 15-lot flexible open space development proposed for the property, and it was uh, turned down by the planning board. Um, because it was 15? Well, there were 15 lots, but um, there's 15 lots on the conventional plan, and we were proposing, I think, a total of 12. Uh, they'd be smaller lots clustered together. Yeah. When you do a flexible open space, you have to demonstrate what you could get with a conventional plan without any waivers. Yeah. We did that. We showed 15 lots. There was some abutting property that was going to be added to her project, but that's been sold off. That was the subject of some applications before you about two years ago, the property to the east. So that, that land's been taken out of the equation. Um, so her, her choices for development are quite limited at this point. Well, um, I mean, it's, you know, she's got land there and, you know, she wants to subdivide it in, in conformance with the zoning bylaw. She could. She can do that. I mean, the, the, the creation of this lot, if it does anything, it doesn't open up a possibilities. It, it, makes, no, it, it, it makes the subdivision a little bit trickier to accomplish because you've got access issues, right? Well, so. Uh, they actually have I'm Westman, 584 yeah. First Parish Road on the other side. They actually have frontage between my property and the main house there that was the access for the 14 acres in the back in the subdivision. So my question is, I have two questions, and one is, does this set a precedent for the 50-foot frontage for the other 14 acres in the back? And the second is, is there enough if they go with a conforming 100-foot frontage on the other side to stay in compliance with the zoning? Where is, well, first of all, uh, where is the access? For the 14 acres in the back, it's between my property and the main house. All right, and where, I'm sorry, where are so you? This, this, <coughs> this so you got 100 there, that they're you got 100 up, there, you got 45 there, you got 50 here. Yeah. So you can easily get a road back in there and they can oh, see this one out. Oh, is your house right here on the street? Just so, is this your house lot here? 584, yes. Here with the septic system in the front here, the right front corner? Correct. Okay. And, it, and, and you say the access to the rear is uh, on 568? Yeah. It's right up the property line. That's what they proposed before, yes. Well, that's what they proposed on the plan that... That's what they were doing. It's for sale again. That lot is still for sale. All right. Well, they, they could do that. 
Right. Regardless asking, of what, yeah. My, my yeah. question was, is this set of precedent so they can do 50-foot frontage in the back? They could do, they, they could perhaps do a 50-foot frontage lot um, into the back or perhaps even two, but the problem is the lot, the amount of land back there, you'd be crazy to do it because you'd be applying an awful lot of land to two houses. If, as long as they continue to have frontage on the street, it, it, as it appears to me, you've got 50 foot frontage to this new lot. You continue to still have 240, 250 plus feet on First Parish. A hundred of that could be given to the existing dwelling and then the remainder of it could be used to access. I'm just asking if this needs to be non-compliant or if they could do this in compliance without the 50-foot exception theory. Peter, well, can I address a question? Yes. All right. Dave, okay, in, no matter what she does over here, she's got to maintain 175 feet through the house where it's built. She has approximately 260 feet of frontage after the 50-foot. So you minus 175, you leave 95 feet. So she could, she could do one 50-foot frontage, but she couldn't do two. Uh, she could do, she doesn't have enough to do 100-foot either. But she, all she needs is 42 feet, which could run back here. And on the 50-foot frontage, you know, they, they could not exercise their special permit, yet, yes, and, and put it in up there. But all she needs to do is A and R this. She could just put a line on it and record it. She wouldn't have to be here. So the answer is, to the extent that it's a precedent, I suppose you could say it's a precedent that reduces the prospect that the land will be subdivided to its maximum capacity. Because the requirement of getting the 50-foot lot is, the 50-foot frontage lot is, the lot itself has to have twice the amount of, of, of area that the zoning bylaw requires. So they're big lots. So you're trading the 50 foot for big lot, so it's less houses. Steve. Yeah, Steve Bjork. I just want to say, um, I want to comment on what Neil had just said there. The 175 feet of lot width, it, whatever they're doing right here with this 50 footer doesn't affect the other land at all. But if she wanted to come back with a couple 50 foot lots on that side and a common driveway, the 175 foot could be measured parallel with the driveway that, rather correct. than the house. Right. So it could possibly be a couple lots over there, not just the one lot. Right. But, but this is not precedent setting because they're meeting the bylaw by doing this. Right. And, 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 uh, and essentially the 50 foot frontage lot bylaw isn't discretionary. Um, when you show the 50 feet, you show the compliance with the conditions of the 50 foot uh, frontage lot bylaw, we grant it. So, any other questions? Any other questions from the board? Okay. Ed, Mr. Motion. <laughs> Move to grant the 50-foot frontage application of the applicant uh, pursuant to a plan dated September 26, 2012, prepared by Ross Engineering. John? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Yes. There you are. Thank you. All right. Mr. McLaughlin, yes. did you get a copy of the letter from uh, Donnellan, uh, Donnellan, Donnellan Trustee? Yes. Okay. okay. I've, had, I've had a conversation. Good. With that. All right. That's the way it should be. Yeah. All right. He had a good mentor. Was my father's position all the time was talk to, him, talk to your enemies first. And then <laughs> yes. Get out of the way. Potential enemies. Okay.
I think that uh, our purpose of this application is um, there, there's two separate special permits that we're asking for. One is for a special permit for a substantial improvement where the property in question is in the town of Cisco Floodplain and Watershed Protection District. Substantial improvement is defined as anything where the size of the house would be more than 25% uh, larger than what was there originally. Uh, the history of this site is that there, there, there was a dwelling there that was raised. Um, the applicant, Edward McLaughlin, who is serving for my website, since we're doing inspector, he received a building permit to raise the existing dwelling. He tore it down and he constructed a footprint um, as shown on the plan. So we're asking that um, the gross floor area be increased 108%. That's obviously more than 25%. And under section 470.6F, the zoning bylaw, it says that in order to have a substantial improvement for a dwelling in a floodplain and watershed protection district, um, there's, there's two basic criteria you have to be met. One is that the uh, proposed structure would comply with the state building code. The second, that it would meet the construction requirements for the um, under FEMA. Uh, FEMA, I believe, is their requirements are, are a part and parcel of the state building code, and um, so those two conditions would be met. The building inspector has to ensure that as well. When you, um, reviews and um, issues the building permit. The other one is under section um, 810.2A. We're asking for an increase over 20%, um, over and above what was on the original house. The original house had at least 625 square feet of the census card in there. Um, and we're asking for an increase of 108% on that. I believe it's roughly 1,300 square feet in total. Um, again, the, the foundation you see is what was approved by the building permit. That's not changing. Uh, it'll be a, a two-story house. It's relatively small. It's about 1,300 square feet. Um, the gross floor area when we're completed. <coughs> so, so the increase. The increase you're asking for is not in the footprint of the property. It's just then you're going. It doesn't. It's currently a one-story. Structure is that uh, right now it is a uh, foundation, but because it only has a foundation, that's the current fo square footage. Or uh, yes. there'd be no more square footage other right. than what's the foundation. But the reason we're the reason we're doubling it is because we're going to yeah, put I two can, floors. I'll just give a quick background on it, and it's been going on for years. But the uh, <laughs> the house was um, damaged in uh, a storm, and under the bylaw, the ocean storm it damaged over a period of time, but. Um, I forget which particular storm we tied the damage into. Um, the building inspection issue a permit to repair, reconstruct, you know, in the same footprint. That's what I did. And so this is 108% over the previous yeah, existing what property was, what that was, was there that was, has been destroyed and right. torn down. And, 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 and we're looking back than, at it. I went to more than 25%, and, and so under both the floodplain and the uh, uh, section six, you need to find it. But he did execute the permit by putting the foundation in, and it's since been extended uh, both by my office and the governor's um, the uh, proclamation or whatever you want to call it decree. The two-year permit extension. Two years and four years, I think. Yeah. All right. Another four. Well, um, is that it. Is that it. Okay. Well, Mr. Donlin. Your, is, uh, your letter uh, states uh, three different yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Bill Donlin, and uh, I own the cottage at uh, uh, 169 Jericho Road. Uh, it's been in the family for over 70 years. And uh, I just uh, wanted to make sure that our interest was protected. Okay. Are you are you satisfied? The it, as as far as I, I I don't haven't heard anything. I've heard actually, you know, relatively little. But um, from the way I read your expressed desires, those the three of them, at least two of them, appear to be satisfied 
by the plan itself, Mike. Uh, yeah, I think one. Of the, I think um, you know, as I as I look down one, two, and three. Yeah. Uh, you know, the first one. Um, we, you know, from what I can see, you know, there was a there's a 4.2 foot uh, feet of, yeah. uh, side uh, boundary between yeah. uh, where the foundation is now and, and our property. Right. And uh, what I wanted to do was make sure that it doesn't get any larger than that. You know, okay, well, closer than that. All right, so the only thing that, the only, the There's a plan that, that has a, a set of stairs, okay, that would actually bring the, uh, the, uh, you know, the structure closer. Okay, well, all right, so, so you're concerned about stairs, decks, uh, eaves, air conditioners, you know, bay windows, that kind of thing, yeah, that, I, that yeah. pushes out beyond the four point. That pushes out beyond the 4.2, that's right. All right. Um, and, uh, and then the other one was the driveway. Yeah, the, the, the other actually uh, B, which I have, is the 1.8, and that's from the street. Right. Uh, you know, that one there, we, we, you know, uh, Mr. Bluff and I have talked beforehand, and I understand that there is a, a small balcony that's going to jet out about another three feet. Um, from the house, uh, from, excuse me, from where the current um, uh, foundation is. Yeah. And that's going to be about eight feet off the ground or whatever. So uh, I don't mind if it's, you know, out another three feet, but I'll, I'll, I'll change what I have to say by saying it's okay if it's 5.1. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and uh, and the third one is the, uh, the access to, uh, to the town parking lot. Yeah, the, the the second one I think we just you know it's just really just a uh, uh, number two is really just having to do with uh, you know not having any um, you know not changing the landscape in any way you know so it'll change the existing uh, direction amount of velocity of water flow onto the property. So oh, okay. Two. Yeah, yeah. And then and then number three. Is um, the driveway that that basically has to do with uh, access to the parking lot uh, and whether or not uh, there's any plan to have access to the you know there's a public parking lot that's abutting right. uh, you know 169 and right now it's it's being temporarily used. Uh, you know for it, it appears to be for construction purposes, which I I don't have any issue with that. Uh, but what I want to uh, make sure of is that there isn't a, um, a permanent uh, driveway that goes, uh, that empties out into a public parking lot. Okay. All right. All right. So it seems to me that uh, just sort of reading between the lines that the real only real issue here is whether or not the exclusion from setbacks that applies for staircases and decks and, and uh, cupolas and, and stuff is going to is creates a problem here is that right yeah and I would just say in the eaves you know under the bylaw you can go 18 inches right so that it would have been anticipated that an eave was going to be right. on the side and you really need that right. uh, you know to shed rain and right. things like that so and I don't that usually isn't a problem with people for people well this is this the foundation's already there the fun but but the foundation was built in the same location as the old one anyway so as built it before we, we took it out, and then as built it after our fall. Uh, okay. So is it is it reasonable to to uh, assume that whatever the whatever structure the original foundation um, held had eaves and you know a side door? I mean I don't know whether it had a side door or whatever. So, I mean, is this a problem? Is this is this a live issue? It had a deck here? on that side, but it had eaves and had a porch in the front. All right. I I reduced the porch completely. And um, Bill and I talked about taking the staircase out completely. Yeah. So that that eliminates, you know, at least the issue on the side. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I think okay. one of the things that could happen is, as opposed to having the stairs come down the side, which would go to a deck that's in the back. Right. Just have the, the stairs reconfigured so they go out towards the back and down. All right. So it wouldn't be any closer than the. The full point all right. Well, uh, since all we're dealing with here is an application with a foundation plan, um, uh, uh, I presume I mean, you, you, you don't have a you wouldn't have an issue with the relief that we're giving you articulating the, those those conditions. Oh, no, yeah, okay. that's right. and, and and we can do that even though staircases and decks. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a part and parcel of of, of, of the uh, relief yeah, that we're granting. Approving a, yeah. an expansion yeah. that you apply a condition, which yeah. you know it is four foot two from the side. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask this for a point of clarification? Yes. Does the does the zoning law allow you to have a, a staircase down the side of the house? As a uh, yes. Yeah, as, yeah. A, as a. Uh, yeah, yeah no, I mean, no, I, I, know, that's, I just I thought that's what you were saying. He right could put a property. he could put right a deck property. right up this pro property. Yes, yeah, okay. No, I was just I was just curious. I, I wasn't hundred percent sure. I, that's I was I've doing. always been kind of curious about that, but yeah, well, most towns don't have that. Yeah. And actually, if you go within three feet of your property line, it, you really got to use fire retardant. Right. I don't know. Do they make fire retardant pressure treated lumber now? Because they didn't used to. Oh, the yeah, composite the stuff. Latex paint. Yeah. <laughs> Use fire retardant paint. I was in the paint business. Latex, years, I got you. Steel paint. Water. Steel. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so your concerns have been I, I, addressed. I, you know, I, I, they've been met as long as, you know, the 4.2, you know, is. All right. Is, uh, well, it is our job to write a decision that, that memorializes the, our collective understanding here. Okay. Okay. The terminology, something to the 4.2 should be maintained. Um, unobstructed. Unobstructed with the exception of 18 inches for eaves, overhangs, and like structures. I mean, that would allow yeah, for that would, a, that would allow for a, a bow window, you know, yeah, coming yeah, out, you know, fine. 18 inches, but but uh, excluding oh, I, I any excluding any kind of deck or from stair. From a structural standpoint, with rain and, and other overhangs. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Glad these things can get worked out. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh oh. Thank you. Would you like to be heard for some? Okay. Good. Good. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> There's <laughs> trouble. Out there. Wait, wait. He's not a neighbor. In favor of Ed rebuilding this house. Thank you. Just gonna, I want to go on record as stating that this was a property that was damaged in the storm of 78 and has yet to be occupied for 34 years. <laughs> and I appreciate the fact Thank that you. earlier the board made a determination that it would be unconstitutional to take away somebody's right to have a single family home. Uh, but this particular one here. Uh, again, we have certain limits in town that this has gone way beyond. I appreciate the fact that he still wants to build this, and I'm in favor of him building this. I think the same thing happened on the judge's house that blew up on Jericho Road, and this particular board allowed the reconstruction of two dwellings 20 to 25 years after they happened, and I hope you vote in favor of Ed's proposal. Don't be particular reason. I, I would, and where, where, are you, where, <laughs> where are you hoping not to have to worry about that? And, uh, I, I would respectfully disagree that this is like the judge's house that blew up. There is a uh, there is a a permit that was issued. It was not appealed, and the permit has been legally extended for the last five, six, seven years. It's not like the judge's house at all. Which did not exist. Don't be throwing that constitutional rights thing in my face. <sighs> Next time you come in here, don't be running out and buying any undeveloped lots. You don't have to buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> you already own your own. And I think we know. Love the floodplain definition. That was awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, so, motion. Come on, Ed. You got one more in you? Uh, I guess it's under eight ten point two, right? 470.6 uh, 470 because it's in the flood line. Yeah. To yeah. grant the applicant special permit pursuant to 470.6 that the um, construction of the property at a 108% increase is not uh, detrimental to the, substantially detrimental to the neighborhood. Good with enough? Condition as discussed. Oh, with the condition as discussed that the um, Property to the the property line to the east shall not be encroached closer than the, as shown on the plan, with the exception of eaves, overhangs, etc., uh, of approximately 18 inches. No steps or ducks. Eight 
18 inch size elevator. <laughs> All right, second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. You are. Paul, you're going to, uh, do you write? Who's right there? Who's right there? Thank you. Good luck, brother. Not voting doesn't get you out of writing. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Do you have all the templates? I've got a couple, yeah. I just want to mention thank you for hearing what I had to say. You're a certain. Go ahead. Thank you for your letter. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm glad it worked out for you. No, it's an improvement. You don't want to get nice to have something. A concrete hole in the wall. On the ground. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Thanks, Bill. Okay. You're welcome. Anything? Any more business? Um, I do have a lot of minutes. Yeah, we have like two years worth of minutes. Yeah. Neil is reviewing them right now. I'm going to be sending a bunch, but I'll send them way in advance. Like the next okay. I've been waiting for him. <laughs> All right. All right. I, I'm going to. Uh, I'm just. Uh, I'm th going to throw this out there. I, I, I should have waited. Uh, I wish Sarah was here, but uh, since uh, you all know that this is my last term, and I think I'm. I, I'm I'll be. I'm, I think I'm up in July. So if one of you wants to use some of the rest of my term to uh, to, to uh, assume the tr the chairman's duties. Don't be bashful <laughs> about about it because we haven't had a vote. By the way, we haven't had a vote on who the chairman is for three years, All right? So I'm probably illegal, but um, and you have to you have to figure out who's going to be the chairman too. So we just start a, thinking about it. We could make a motion. Well, you want to make the motion when all of us are here. <laughs> Motion to adjourn, please. So moved. All right. All those in favor. All right. All right.